Ekle bakalım. Tamam güzel. Sesi neresi alıyor? Mikrofondan mı geliyor? Tamam.
Soralım göstersin nasıl yapacağımızı. Kamera mı? Ahmet şu Şu an kayıtta değil mi? Değil. Bak. Bak görüyor musun? Tamam işte bu tuşu. Şöyle yapmıştık. Ee, kamerayı da şöyle yapacağım. Sonra şöyle oldu. Şöyle değil mi? Tamam. Yani bir şey yok mu? O noktayı şuna mı basacağız? Hmm, direkt şu kırmızıya basacağız. Bak, kolaymış değil mi? Tamam. Bilmem ona bakarsın bir şey olmaz. Şu yapacağız. Şu yapacağız. 
şey var burada kamera şu anda açık ama nereden başlıyor? Ha şuradan. Tamam şu anda görünüyor. Ha şimdi bir soracağım onu. Zoom yapmayı nasıl yapıyorsun? Şu şey mi? Tamam. Tamam. Tamam Erdal bir hallederiz biz. Olur. Tamam hadi görüşürüz. Tamam görüşürüz. Şimdi bak. Tamamen açıp kapatma. Diyor kapat. Hiç sabah geleceğim de böyle. Tamam hiç kapatma ama ayarlarla. Şimdi bak. Şey olduğu zaman konuşmacı ile birlikte bu ekrana tamam mı? Tamam. Konuşmacı zoomuna başladığı anda şu an zoom yaparsın tamam mı? Şöyle bunu ayarlarsın artık bir şekilde. Tamam mı? Şu anda şey var. Ona göre bir bilmem bir şey getirirsin. Yok bir şey dedim. Ben sabahla geleceğim mi hocam? Kapalı olursa nasıl açacağım? Ya açarız ama biz geleceğiz. Gelecek. Ya ben çözdüm şuradan zoom, tamam. şuradan aşkı tamam. tamam. yapıyorsun. Buradan sadece kayıt var. Sadece şu Ama şu anda şu olduğunda siz hiçbir şey yapmayın. Şu anda görüntü gidiyor. Şu olduğunda kayda başlarsınız. Hayır Oturun. hareket etmeyelim zoom olarak. Hayır hayır zoom olarak hareket edeceğiniz onu söylüyorum. Çünkü konuşmacı orada ilk başladığında tamam mı? Ya da işte şey böyle oturma şöyle konuşmaya başladığında şöyle geniş alırsın. Tamam. Ee, sunumu başladı. Oraya verirsin. Tamam mı? Sunuma zoom yaparsınız. Tamam. <gülüyor>
Bakın sen de Kaydı başlasın. <gülüyor> Welcome back. We continue with digital policy presentations. Professor Dr. Oruç Raif Önmural will moderate this session. Thank you. Welcome to our afternoon session. We have six uh, research papers in this session. Uh, I just find out that two of them will be online. Uh, two of them will be video presentations. And uh, two of them will be in-person presentations. So we are starting with the online presentations. Uh, online Okay. Our uh, first presentation is uh, research results done at VTT Technical Research Center of Finland. Uh, VTT is one of the Europe's leading research institutions owned by the government. The objective of this center is to advance utilization and commercialization of research and technology. Today we are uh, fortunate to have Mr. Dr. Juhat Barsina, I apologize for the pronunciation, uh, to present their uh, research results on digital forensic of five cyber attacks at the electrical power grid sites. Okay, thank you for the introduction. I hope you can hear me. Thank you. Great. Uh, and you pronounce my name just great. It's Juha Persinen, and uh, that uh, seems to be easy for you to pronounce correctly. Okay. Uh, let's go to subject. Uh, so, in our research, in this paper, we compromise a, comprise a three network based cyber attacks in our laboratory. Uh, we have a laboratory which we can use to press, uh, test different kind of substation, substation things. It's for intelligent energy, but we also can test different kind of cyber attacks there. There are uh, intelligent energy devices, IEDs, there's a real-time simulation, real -time simulation RTDS, which can simulate the whole electric grid. So we can make a real kind of test on the re real kind of environment, which we don't break anything. Uh, uh, in, this in this paper, we have analyzed three different kind of uh, cyber attacks, and uh, we we test, uh, we study how you can detect these uh, 
using the network forensic ways. And we also an, uh, organized last year a workshop for uh, different persons from energy sector and check about how easily they can find without much of information how we can find these kind of attacks. Uh, one of the very important characteristics of any, almost any kind of industrial control systems is that uh, usually the network configuration will be very stable for a very long time. And also the traffic patterns of these industrial control systems are usually deterministic. And these two characters helps a lot when you try to analyze the very different kind of forensic analysis things, but also in usual uh, in usual cases, if there are any kind of misconfiguration or anything, so you can you can use it also in other ways than analyzing the digital forensics. And these two characters also they help when you analyze something against the baseline. Okay, let's take a first case. And uh, usually, okay, okay, there's two questions which are formulated as characters. First one is: Are there any changes in the network configuration? And it's the, in this case, we used, okay, we used the Wireshark, which is open source tool, all of these uh, analysis. And is using different, easy, easily used uh, filter like ARP, you can see that there's some devices, some new device, device doing the ARP scanning, which is a little bit suspicious usually, for example, in the ICS environment. And also the same devices using, make scanning TCP one, 102 port and uh, second question are there variation in traffic pattern on network uh, well this picture is quite small in this sense but uh, there are spike in this case and spikes usually very suspicious in ICS environment okay if there could be some maintenance work there can be some software update the normal case this is very suspicious. And also, there are very many new connections. You can use the TCP connection sync filter, and then you can use the Firesack IOGRAPH, which is very good to analyzing the patterns in the graphic. You see there's lots of new connections, and especially there are very high spike in the beginning of this anomaly. And uh, Okay, now we know there's ARP, there's TCP 102 scanning, there's a lot of traffic, there's lots of TCP SYN packets. And because we, it's well, quite well known that this 102 port is used in IAC 61850 manufacturer messaging specification MMS protocol, which con it's usually used for, for uh, operating the uh, relays in the substation or, or any, any kind of device what they are. So we can start to check about what kind of things is happening in this MS, MMS protocol. And there's a, in the left side of this spike, this is a normal operation. So it's normal case, it's quite stable. There is so one analyzing software, checking about things, how it's going. And then there's a spike. And then after that one, there's a lot, lot of traffic. Well, not, not so lots of bracket, it's only about 10 packets per second, but still something is happening here. And if you follow the TCP stream, what you have in this spike, spike you can see that it's, uh, there's a whole data model of substation is downloaded. Unfortunately, this is quite small in the screen, but there's a lot of, because this is unencrypted, you can see clearly that all the different kind of variables what they are used in substation the substation data model are uploaded and also after this uh, data model has been transferred this is then they start be operating on one of these relays of the system and in this case because this use uh, select before use system kind of system they always have three different messages for one operation. So this is quite easily defined in the find. And actually, this attack is similar as uh, industrial malware used about the uh, 1960s in Ukraine. And this is definitely, this is the industrial, industrial IAC 6850 module. The module operates that it finds, first trying to find the local devices 
Then it scan, scans which of these have a 102 open. Then it download, try to download the substation data model. It analyzes it all, offline so you don't see anything when you analyze it. And then it starts to operate relays, turning it on, off, on, off. An important thing also understanding is that this misuse the normal operation of substation so there's no any kind of vulnerabilities. And this actually is quite common also in ICS environment because quite often you can miss the mal malware or the ATPs can uh, use them or misuse them using the normal operation. They don't have to find vulnerabilities. But luckily enough, this kind of attack is very easy to find because the behavior of this is these kind of things don't happen very usually in user life. There's a lots of uh, good information. There's also a link for the very good analysis of the industry if, if somebody's interested in. So let's go to case two. Well, the case two, when you're checking about are there any variations in the traffic pattern on the network, you can actually quite see in the right side of this uh, Iograph that there is uh, 200,000 packets per second. And normally, it's only a uh, couple of hundreds. So it, it's very clear indication in this case. So this is the denial of, denial of service attack. So that's, and that's also, there is also a research paper describing this kind of thing attacks more. But one in, in, interesting thing, this, this one is because this is using actually the ICS 6850 generic object oriented substation event protocol, which actually is not using TCP IP at all. It's using, it ob, ob, operates over the Ethernet. And on Ethernet, you only have a, a ARP address or the MAC, actually the MAC address. And to find which device actually behaving badly, you actually have to go to check about the network switch logs to find from which port this, this traffic is coming. So to, so this pickup don't help you to find the bad, bad, bad actor in this network. Okay, let's go to case three. And case three actually things getting interesting because if when you're checking that, uh, what are the changes in the network configuration? Okay, there's no new devices. There's no ARP scans. There's no TCP sync, sync packets, there's no new connections. And also, when you're checking about the variation, well, this, is a diff this looks a little bit different because there's a, the traffic has been modified between, but there's still no any kind of spikes there. So there's nothing happening in this network. But it seems to be nothing happening in the overload, overload this network. So this actually requires that you know that something is wrong because relays are behaving badly. They're turning on and they're turning off. They're turning on, so the lights are lights are flick, flickering somewhere, some area. So you have to check about more, more, and then you need. And when you say try, try this goose protocol, you find that it's it's not as stable as it could be. There is an in normal case because there is about maximum two packets per second, and then you have then you see there is a anomaly there. Something is happening. This is not normal behavior. And this this actually requires you to go to check about each goose packets what you have, and then you can find these things here. That actually this uh, I point this as an arrow here. There's a sequence number between two, diff two adjacent packets. The sequence number is uh, uh, jumping from 0 to 138. And the problem is because it's 0 have uh, always preference. So if, if this uh, relay gets two packets, and if somebody have a sequence number 0, it only, only use that one and drop the other way away. So there's actually there is a strange variation in sequence numbers. And uh, in Wireshark, you can use filters. So you can actually, if you take filters that you can check about which, which have a, which goose protocol packets have a zero and which have a above the zero, you can actually see this kind of picture. And actually these black ones here, or more, more, more closer to black, this is a normal operation. But then the anomaly, anomaly or the malware is actually putting the, uh, also the package which have a, higher pre preference goose packets which actually drop the drop from the 
the right ones and open the open the relays. So and this is actually normal case there's only two packets per second. Bad case is a three packets per second. So this is not you can't see this is a spike. And uh, because in normal case you can have a million or uh, hundreds of thousands packets per second, not a second per but per minute. So this is actually in ICS there's a lots of different kind of measurements going, so this can hide uh, quite well if you don't know what you try to find. And this uh, this goose goose meta space attack is actually also well explained in some uh, some literature before, okay, about 2020, and uh, we have found it out in this groups. They find this MMS attack easily. They find actually this domain uh, this uh, domain uh, this. Uh, this DOS attack they find also easily, but this is more difficult to find because this need, you need to understanding the protocols well. You need to understand that this kind of things can happen. Luckily enough, this kind of things is a little bit uh, quite easy to mitigate because if you you can turn the protection of the switch uh, network switch on that you don't they don't accept wrong uh, MAC address in the wrong port. So this is this is a mitigate a lot of mitigation for this, but still this is difficult to find okay uh, let's go to conclusion so we have a, we have analyzed three different attacks in our net in our uh, test network which is uh, which have a, which have a real hardware and we also have a real time simulator with anal which can present the whole grid an important thing also is none none of these attacks use any kind of vulnerabilities not vulnerabilities of the devices they attack the real devices and they, use, they misuse the normal operation. And to find these attacks, you should always have a baseline. Even in the ICS network, when you have a constant uh, traffic patterns and uh, the network don't chase, you still have a benefit if you understand well what kind of baseline you have. And uh, we have plans to continue this, uh, this, work, this, uh, this uh, research because uh, we will analyze the new, new kind of uh, attacks which you can uh, make in this ICS environment and also uh, in special in this uh, uh, grid, uh, intelligent grid attacks. So, thank you. That's... Thank you. Uh, any questions from the audience? There are uh, no questions here. I have a question. Uh, may not make sense, but uh, is there a man in the middle attack uh, problem in this network? <laughs> Thank you, Joa, for your presentation. So let's go to the second online presentation. Uh, this research is done in the uh, University of Australia and uh, Chris Mohammed in Fan University in Saudi Arabia. The title of the presentation is How to Provide Machine Learning for the Law. Forensics through flight path analysis. Well, in uh, recent years, drones have become very popular. So, due to their popularity, they are now subject to cyber attacks. We listen to authors who research on what type of attacks and what can be done about those type of physics. The presentation will be done by Nazir Tim Mohammed. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes
Yes, we can hear you well. Yeah, but I can't see the slides. Okay, there, there we go. Slides are good, children. Yeah, excellent. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll be speaking about unsupervised machine learning for drone forensic investigations for the next few minutes. Actually, the presentation uh, supposed to be done by Dr. Naeem from Deakin University, but he got busy, and uh, I'm going to. I mean, go through his slides and uh, hopefully I'll answer some of your questions. So let's let's get started without wasting your time. The, ma the main idea, I mean, you already know uh, about drones. Drones are part of our life nowadays. I mean, in many applications, including military and civilian applications, drones are already there. And sometimes these drones do something wrong against the law. That brings us how would we prove such and such drone from drone to the operator how this person can be convicted in the court usually that's done through the forensic so this because it's a digital system so it's called digital forensics so how would we do the digital forensics on drones what are the problems we have that's the basic study which we are going to discuss today Okay, so the rest of the my presentation is basically I'll give you very brief introduction, like I started, and then go through the background, and briefly about the methodology and what we have done, and what conclusions we made. Okay, so here is introduction. So um, drones basically, another name is unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs. We usually call it UAVs, and for normal people, drones is commonly used commonly used name they they can operate in two different ways number one it can operate completely autonomously or it can be remotely controlled by somebody else okay the completely autonomous working drones they have already pre-configured flight path that means they have a mission they have a the complete path and they use the gps to go from one location to another location do the job and come back okay but the other one semi-autonomous or remotely controlled they are controlled by a person who is sitting at a distant location the problem is the drones can be attacked by some unwanted person i mean we call them hackers malicious users how they attack drone like any digital systems has vulnerabilities and somebody can use the existing vulnerabilities, known or zero-day vulnerabilities, to do some attacks on the drones or use these drones to do something wrong. So to prove that case, that somebody has done wrong with this drone, what we are going to do? We have to have a, some sort of digital forensic system which comprises of getting that drone from the crash site, take the da data out of the drone, save the evidence whatever you found preserving the evidence is very important and then make a copy of that do some analysis get some results make a proof and then take this proof to the court or law enforcement law enforcement office okay. so what people have done in this case what has really happened several people have done some work um, to analyze the drone data, but the whole system, the whole drone system comprises of three big components. This is called unmanned aerial vehicle system. One of the parties, UAV, the drone, but the other two parts, which you can guess, is a remote control site, okay, which you are seeing here, a remote control site. And then we have the communication. So you have a base station that's what we call command and control from there communication happens communication goes to the drone and drone reacts okay. what drone has what is important for us it has lots of sensors that collect the data and one of the most commonly used sensor which you again you can guess is a digital camera high resolution digital cameras in addition to this there are other other sensors to do get the information from different whatever the purpose of the drone okay um now how would we get the data there are three places to get the data one 
through the communication channel, wireless communication channel, through the command second, through the command and control, which is the base station. Three mainly for the drone. So here we are mainly focused upon the drone. Okay. The drone. The drone. So can you all hear me, sir? Suddenly something happened. Can you hear me? Okay. The information that can be extracted from the drone, drone could be many. First and most important information that you can extract is the the points, the locations through which the drone has passed. How would we get the location? Using the global position system. The GPS coordinates, we can get it. Connecting all the GPS coordinates gives us the flight path. Okay. We can get the motor or I mean how the motors or the drones worked. We can get the angles it made, the pitch angle, the roll angle, the yaw angle, all these angles we can get. We can get the, the time the drone has flown, the battery status, the commands that are issued from the base station, and the information of all the sensors. All this information can be extracted, okay? Mainly the fight paths and the video recordings are on the standard card, on, on the SD card on the drone itself. That's, that's the main one. And this is all encrypted, we need to decrypt it. So several people have worked on these flight logs and video recordings, flight paths and try to do some sort of analysis on that. They try to reconstruct the path and try to prove that this is what really happened. But the problem is the manual process is boring. It takes a lot of work. Okay? Sometimes it's very tedious. Some of the drones, which the drone which we uh, also analyzed in this case study, is the DJI Phantom 4. It has multiple paths. That means multiple manually somebody has to go through these these flight logs and try to find these anomalies. So we thought, why not just see apply some kind of unsupervised, not supervised, supervised become a little bit of manual again, unsupervised machine learning to detect anomalies in the in the flight operations or flight paths. So that's what we the main aim of this study. So what we have done? This is a simple methodology we have followed. The first step, we need to get the data set. So get the drone, meaning somehow a drone is captured, acquire the drone and take the data set from that. Get all possible logs from the, from the drone, usually they are in .dat format. Combine the dot dat, I mean dot dat files into CSV, comma separated values, and then see whether whatever the information we got is it really useful? Is it complete? Incomplete? Then not much use, not much use of for the study for the forensics. So we can discard. So useful logs which are in CSV format, combine all of them on that one. Take some features make them into clusters and see the clusters and try to see when, whether there are anomalies or not. And what we use, as I said before, we are used, we have used unsupervised clustering techniques for that. Okay, this is, these are the steps for our methodology. Then, where did we apply this methodology? So we did not um, mean generate our own data set. We used the existing data sets available on the VTO labs. We used existing VTO lab data set. Basically, we used for the Phantom 4, converted their DAT files into CSV files and CSV files. We combined all of them and we got 38 files, of which we found only 23 are usable. So others were have some problems, we had to discard them. From there, we found I mean the CSV has 289 fields. Okay, we just chose 10 features. Okay. 10 fields. Then next question comes is which features? I put these features on the right hand side. You can see the right hand side. We took these features like longitude, latitude, height, I mean the height of the flight, roll, pitch, yaw, what I was talking, the throttle speed, 
the distance travel okay um, and the flight number flight number one two three four if it has taken multiple flights all these features we have taken and then we applied the un unsupervised clustering techniques we chose two techniques one is k means second one is gaussian mixture model gmm okay and we compared the performance so this is we, we uh, this was our methodology and this is our data set and let's see what we have seen with our simple analysis okay uh, before we get into analysis I'll just two points about KMM and uh, gmm i mean k means and the g uh, mean gmm very simple uh, k means uses the euclidean distances basically it tries to make the clusters based on the distances and wherever the distance is minimum that means the center of the clusters are not changing that's where it's going to stop okay but on the other hand the gaussian you can understand um, from the name itself it uses it looks for it makes the cluster based on the distribution data distribution basically gaussian distribution so it makes the clusters based on the gaussian distribution okay so each distinct distribution becomes a cluster so we have two we choose these two just to study which of these behaves well and before we give it to gmm or k means we need to know how many clusters we are going to work on usual way to know that number of clusters is through elbow plot you know this kind of plots okay where we increase the number of clusters one two three four five six seven eight nine ten until which right here until uh, 18 and 19 and we found that the slope of this one the that means errors is changing at three so we said that the number of clusters in the data in the flight path are three so we have taken as three clusters okay now we applied on this data with three clusters uh, the supervised unsupervised methods came okay means and the gmm this is the first plot. The first plot, what I'm showing you here is pitch versus the roll. The left side is using, oh, sorry, using the one methodology and the second side using the second methodology. Right side is the K-means and the left side is Gaussian mixture model, GMM. Okay. Now we see that most of the flight path is linear. Okay. Uh, but we see it a backward movement from 50 minus 50 to 150 degrees and hit this one the one which is marked here it looks anonymous and both gmm and the k-means so this anomalous pitch and roll path so so we could able to find one uh, one anonymous thing from the from the data then we plotted um, I mean throttle and pitch to see the difference so we are showing the gmm again on the left and the k-means on right we can we can see again at zero at zero point mean when the throttle is zero we have seen some use use unusual pitch I mean the pitch look at 100 to 150 that looks unusual we can identify that both of them but but look at the left side and left side and right side one it looks like okay means are making the cluster based on the distance and we can see that one and by and and uh, GMM, it's making not because of distance, it's, we can see the both, I mean, the, all the three clusters are based on the distribution. We further investigated what really happened, uh, why this anonymous uh, information. Then we found out that in flight 19, flight 19, see that one, flight 19, that green color, this was anomalous information is coming from the flight 19. Okay, when we looked at, and look at the clock and it happened only the initial initial time itself that means the beginning of the flight itself and further analysis with the csv view we saw we found out that i mean during the initial event itself there was a high pitch somehow something happened to this one and we have noticed uh, something wrong so we concluded that um, there is some anomalous event there is some anomalous event happened during the initial flight stage okay there is this big sharp increase in the angle the pitch angle and the sharp descent of the drone when the thrust was zero itself or thrust was very zero very low okay uh, from the comparison parts of gmm and k means we felt that gmm is doing better job better job and it is more suitable for analyzing uh, drone data Okay, we are not saying that KMM is worse than GMM is better for this situation, uh, for the for analyzing 
uh, for analyzing this flight data of these drones, we felt that GMM is doing a better job. Okay, and we could we showed that yes, these techniques can find anomalous data easily without any man in intervention. That means reduce the load of a person, especially when you have when we have lots of logs and so much of data, and at least the initial work can be done by unsupervised learning. So the, let's come to the conclusion. So our conclusion is unsupervised clustering can be used on the flight logs of drones, especially the Phantom 4, Phantom P4 drones in our case. Logs contains lots of information. So there is an automated, well thought out methodology needed. So machine learning, especially unsupervised machine learning, can be useful. We, we studied K-means and GMM, and we found out that GMM does a better job, although both of them are useful in finding the anomalies. In future, we are planning to generate the data sets, which contains malicious, means some kind of cyber attacks. Cyber attacks generate an anomalous information in the data, and we wanted to see whether our unsupervised methodologies can detect these anomalous information. Thank you very much for your concentration and listening to me. If you have any questions, please, uh, please let me know. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you for your presentation. There are no questions from there. Uh, next. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bashir Atmeri. I'm from Jordan University of Science and Technology, and I will be presenting a paper about the digital forensics of networks and social networking applications based on browsers. This work has been done by my students, Hala, Nan, and Hamza, and the joint group supervised by Professor Tawi. Welcome to the University of Science and Technology. Yes, if I find my presentation, I will provide introduction to social media forensics and root browser forensics and briefly discuss them, the methodology that we put in our study. Focusing mainly on one of the mainstream social networking applications, which is TikTok. And like briefly described from examiner as a tool that we developed to perform uh, forensic investigation for these applications and finally conclusion. As we know, social networking sites are widely used for people to open exchange ideas and to interact with each other. And we initially used to promote friendship among users. However, due to the expression growth of social media and instant messaging applications has facilitated the development of many serious cyber crimes and attack incidents. And of course, the increasing familiarity of these applications uh, has started to provide evidence that can be used in digital forensic investigation, which has been exploited for different cyber activities, including uh, fraud and identity theft and sexual degradation and many other malicious activities. Now, group browser forensics is very important area of research because searching for evidence left by group browser activities is a crucial component of digital forensic investigations, where almost every movement and transaction made by a suspect will be recorded and will be stored somewhere in the machine that has been used. And this will include uh, evidence in the cache, in the history, the cookies, download this, and many other 
maybe that's its process. Of course, with the following good browser for instance, there are several developments that include timeline analysis, which helps to investigate to determine the suspect's identity in the correct time zone. Also, extraction of significant information related to digital forensics, such as search words and user activity, decoding important words at a particular URL, because important words are not relevant, they make investigation difficult. And of course, you can have a big good browser information, because again, a suspect can delete to browse or web browser load information to destroy evidence. In our study, we focused mainly on uh, Google Chrome, Google Browser, as it has the largest market share in recent years, as we can see here, which is due to several interesting features of uh, Google Chrome, such as integrating with Google services, synchronization of user passwords between devices and the ability to use extensions and plugins. And among the three modes of Google Chrome, which are the regular, the guest, and the incognito, we focus mainly on the regular profile, regular mode, which is the default mode used by most users as it stores their users' activity on disk. And here we collected several artifacts from Google Chrome, which include URLs, downloads, keywords, search terms, tables, history database, Google table. Google database, top size table, and top size database of different table, as well as web data database, Google, and cash flow. For our study, we uh, used a very simple scenario where we have a suspect user with access to a laptop, started by uh, wiping all previous uh, data related to Chrome web browser, and then creating a Google account, Gmail account for this user. Then creating accounts on three main social networking platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok, and then performing certain activities in order to be able to detect the uh, collected evidence. And for our study, we followed the standard digital forensic methodology, which include four phases the Caesar acquisition, analysis, and reporting. The Caesar phase is to detain and preserve the machine used in the cyber crime. And here, uh, we ensure that the machine has continuous power supply and it has been disconnected from the internet. In addition to acquisition, where we acquired the data from the detained machine, here we acquired data from the hard drive and from memory using special tools. Then performing analysis on this uh, collected or acquired data, and finally reporting. And here is the list of uh, tools used in our study, and the description and the application uh, targeted by each tool. I will just uh, list them quickly as you like. Magnetizing this is for acquiring data from the hard drive. Browser is to examine to acquire and analyze data. Need to cache the work. For doing videos cast to the device, uh, download, which is mainly to acquire data from the memory, and uh, the Excel editor at to mainly read the acquired data from the RAM file. I'll just quickly show you snapshots of the artifacts collected from Google Chrome in general as a starting point. I have to point out that. Uh, all these artifacts are originally found in the default Chrome folder. Assume that uh, we are working with Google Stage Machine, which is shown here to the left, where we go to the Chrome profile folder, and from here we get access to several tables such as the history database, the download database, the keyword search, history passwords, top sites visited by users. And Omnibox shortcuts, this is used in Autofin. And now coming to a focus on uh, TikTok forensics, again as a mainstream uh, networking social or social networking application. Uh, here we have again a simple scenario where the user performs uh, several actions such as watching a video, uploading a video. Uh, writing comment, then deleting the comment, uh, 
checking with another user, and then deleting the chat to destroy the evidence, and sharing the video either through TikTok or through other social networking applications. So our objective is to collect evidence about these actions performed by this user. And here we show that we were able to collect such evidence. For example, uh, making sure that the user has indeed watched a video using certain username can be shown in the first table. Uh, evidence of uploading a video where the URL of that video is found in the history folder. And even we can uh, get a copy of the video using the video cache tool, even if the video was deleted by the user. And more important, in case that uh, a user uh, wrote a comment and then deleted that comment, then we can find the uh, URL and the comment in the memory using the dumbbell tool and uh, of course using the incident to read that uh, file. So this is actually uh, shows the user and the video ID and the command wrote by that user. Also, similar thing regarding retrieving chat and evidence. Uh, we found that whatever conversation that TikTok assigns a conversation ID for that conversation. In fact, it consists of two IDs, one for the local user and the data ID for the other user. Uh, and here's the ID used in our case, which also shows the evidence that uh, both the user or the suspect user had sent a certain message which can be read from the memory even if it was deleted initially. And finally, regarding sharing uh, video links, whether uh, using TikTok uh, messaging feature, the first one, or even sharing with uh, Facebook or WhatsApp or Twitter. In all cases, we were able to retrieve the evidence that the video has been shared. In summary, we saw that the different actions performed by this user were uh, collected as evidence from the target machine using different uh, tools, as I mentioned earlier. This table summarizes the list of evidence and what can be retrieved exactly and how. This is the creation of the same table. And as an extension, we uh, developed a Python based tool to mainly acquire, analyze, and visualize data from uh, social networking applications, mainly TikTok, Facebook, and Twitter. Assuming that they are using, or the user is using uh, Google Chrome browser for this activity. This uh, Chrome seminar has several features, such as searching for specific keyword in the memory image. Retrieving artifacts from the memory image, filtering and retrieving artifacts from the Chrome history folder depending on specific application, and retrieving, retrieving users' login information, including passwords, assuming that they are in plain text, and uh, retrieving users' downloads, displaying retrieving artifacts on the terminal and on the external files and preserving the extracted artifacts in external folder for data use. So in summary, this tool facilitates the process of uh, forensic investigation, specifically for social networking applications. This uh, flowchart shows the main components of uh, Chrome Examiner that we have developed, where we can perform investigation regarding to browser artifacts or regarding memory artifacts and you can select uh, which type of uh, social networking application is mainly targeted for this uh, forensic investigation whether it is TikTok, Facebook or Twitter or even you can select all of them so you can uh, get access to user downloads uh, login data, fingerprints and so on and here I show just uh, example snapshots of, the, of this tool where we uh, are given a menu 
that allowed the user to select the profile targeted for first investigation, whether it is a uh, guest profile or profile for user A or B. And you can select the application as I mentioned, whether it is Facebook, Twitter, or TikTok. And the uh, output will be displayed in Excel file or any format of choice for the user. In conclusion, we see that social media has been extensively used to commit crimes or to hide sensitive information that would lead to abusing as suspects of their wrongdoings. And digital forensics is considered a fair system toward deterring cyber criminals and holding them accountable for their criminal acts. In summary, this paper demonstrated how to protect individuals from TikTok as one of the most in social media applications and provide a generic overview of the wrong center as a tool to collect evidence from other social media applications. The collected evidence includes shared videos, videos, shared links, shared messages, etc. As a future work, we will extend our work to include other Google browsers other than Google Chrome and include other social networking applications as well. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening and if you have any question. If I use Google Chrome in incognito mode, what kind of artifacts are available for you to examine? Only the artifacts found in memory, not in history or URL table. Only in memory. Right. And we targeted the regular profile. We didn't target incognito or guest mode. Because normally, if I'm malicious, I will be hiding my track by using incognito board. That is possible, yes, I agree with you, but uh, we assume that you are yeah, targeting uh, regular uh, users, okay. normal or daily operation. And we made this point clear in the beginning that we are mainly uh, targeting the regular mode. Okay. This is a good question and it could be for future work. Thank you for this very nice presentation. Uh, I have a small question um, regarding the, the, the traces that you have there. How trustable are they? So, uh, can somebody create a trace which is not true? And are there mechanisms to avoid creating traces? In fact, uh, that was beyond the, the scope of this project. In fact, uh, students perform the activities. Uh, starting with wiping all the all the data, and the objective was to find the evidence about performing different activities. But uh, the point you are raising is very important. If we are talking about malicious uh, context, that is uh, very mysterious. However, our study didn't cover that uh, part. Yes. Any other question, please? I got one more question. Yes. Uh, just also, in order to respond to various questions, this is Giannolo from Central State University. In incognito mode, you have local storage and station storage. And I don't think you covered uh, in your work. Uh, it's a web storage mechanism, local storage, station storage. So if you use incognito mode, the information is going to be stored in session storage. And as well, as well, you should just shut up your browser. Uh, the remaining artifacts on the memory is only going to be here. The area that you can recover the artifacts. Ah. Other than that, you are. Uh, um. okay. So, in follow of this, uh, did you also consider index DB and level DB files in your study? No, we didn't uh, consider that. Okay. Uh, because the storage mechanisms that you look at are uh, the oldest technology. Okay. They are limited in terms of what they can store. So uh, my suggestion would be looking for web storage and index DB. Index DB can store up to 50 megabytes of information that is going to give you way more information than you can right. from those websites. Okay, great. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for your listening. Um, thank you.
Thank you for your presentation. Uh, next, we have a presentation from Prat University. Uh, Software and Digital Forensic Engineering. Uh, the title of the presentation is Deep Learning Based Fast Phase Detection and Relocation Algorithm for Forensic Analysis. The uh, authors in this uh, research propose a software uh, supported with uh, deep learning model to analyze video and image files. The paper will be presented by Dr. Tara Bashi. Welcome to my presentation. Hi, I am Mohamed Tabashi, Master Program Student of uh, Software Engineering at Pratt University. Today I am going to present uh, a paper entitled A Deep Learning Based on Face, Face Detection and Recognition Algorithm for Forensic Analysis. Uh, my presentation contents is I am going to discuss the study in seven titles. Firstly, uh, I try to define the problem and then I want to present the methods used, some information about the face detection and recognition process. We have a license with graphic user interface. Uh, I want to show some uh, screens from this application. Uh, lastly, I am going to discuss the results of the study and uh, make some future works. Uh, problem definition. Digital forensic consists of some process that focuses on protecting and investigating data in electronic devices to be used as evidence in solving a crime. Uh, in the, the forensic process consists of uh, four stages. Uh, first, protection and identification of the electronic device. And the uh, second stage is obtaining evidence. Uh, then third stage is uh, analysis. The problem here is that the analysis is dependent on capabilities of the examiner and the analyzer software. Also, the large amount of data inside the device, consisting of multimedia files uh, such as videos, uh, images, and sound, this process takes a long time. We want to develop a solution to speed up the process and increase the success of the analysis. In, in the study, we focus on identification the people found in multimedia files retrieved from forensic evidence. The methods we use when identification of people, we propose to make this process in three stages. Uh, first, face detection. Uh, face detection is cropped face image in original image uh, as seen in the picture. The YOLO version 5 framework is used to object detection from image and video files, uh, video frames. Uh, the second stage is face recognition. Uh, we crop the face image and we want to uh, Extract feature for face image. Recognition of the detected face by extracting its features with deep learning. For feature extraction, the VGG face model is used with the rest of 50 backbone. Uh, the last stage is face matching. It's the recognition of the face whose features are extracted by comparing it with the full faces whose features are registered in the database. The similarity of the feature is calculated by using cost equation. Uh, face detection, a uh, YOLO version which can detect objects from image files for face detection has been preferred because of its speed and success parameters. Uh, first step is dataset and collection. The dataset used for the training of the dataset, uh, I'm sorry, the training of the face detection model consists of data collected from the internet and some data from the wider face dataset. This dataset has been shared publicly on GitHub. Our mixed generated dataset contains 7,092 images. According to the area to be used, the data includes images where a certain part of the face is covered, especially with masks, heads, sunglasses, etc. The second step is data labeling. In order to start training in the OLA framework, the data must be labeled 
in the DAW format in square. The data were first labeled with less than 50 copy model by detecting the face and organized with the label image master application. After labeling and uh, editing 7,092 7, images, 1845 labels were created in the, our data set. Uh, face detection the last step is uh, training. Transfer learning is preferred because number of data is not very large. Uh, our 77,092 image is uh, not very large. Medium model is preferred because of speed and success. The yellow framework uh, has come with uh, four different model files per trainer. Uh, it's a small, uh, large, medium, etc. The model is pre-trained in, uh, in eight, eight different classes. Parameters create effect the training and success of the model. During the training process, we implemented different values for parameters. The most optimum results were obtained with the following. Uh, our bed size is 8, we tried uh, for 816, and uh, our image size is uh, 416. Our equal size is uh, 200, we tried uh, 100. 200 and 300. We tried 100, uh, it's over 50, under 50, uh, then we tried uh, 300, uh, is over 50. Our threshold value is uh, 0 0.4, we tried uh, 0 0.1 to uh, 0 0.9. Our pre-trained model is medium, we tried uh, uh, all of them model, yellow version 5 frameworks. Uh, the hard way of computer user for training has features in the study, 3 GHz, 9th uh, generation i7 processor, and uh, 32 GB of RAM, 8 GB RTX super graphics card. Model has been trained 20 hours and 35 minutes to achieve optimal parameters for this. Uh, face, face recognition. A model file was obtained after the training. With this model file, faces can be detected on the images. The next step includes the recognition of the detected faces. The recognition of the face consists of uh, two steps. In the first step, the features are extracted from the detected face on image. Then in the second stage, the extracted face features are tried to match the detected face in the database. For recognition of the detected face, retrained DGG face 2 model was used. Face images were given as input to DGG face model with input size of 200, 200, at the 175 layer of the ResNet 50 model, which consists of uh, 177 layers, and we obtained a face features vectors. Uh, the vectors size of a uh, one 2048 feature vector obtained. Face matching, the final step is identification people with feature vector of the face. The distance calculation is made by comparing the future vector of the face with the future vectors in the database. There are many different methods to calculate the distance between vectors, uh, for example, Manhattan, Minkowski, Euclidean, Cosine, etc. We use a different methods and determine that Cosine is the best, uh, as seen in the picture, Cosine distance formula. The distance of the features obtained from the faces are calculated and the features are compared. Faces whose distance value is under the threshold value are, are matched. Our threshold confidence is 0 0.4. Uh, we have a graphic user interface. The study was to develop a solution for the analysis part of the forensic process. Therefore, a graphical interface was developed that forensic examiners could use the system. Uh, Yola version 5 compiled in PyTorch. VGG phase Python is also developed by developing the interface. We choose PyQT framework uh, because PyQT5 framework is developed in Python. Uh, Use for easy integration. Uh, as seen in the picture, uh, our interface. First, we, we selected an input folder. Uh, then we select uh, we selected input folder for consist of image and video files to be one to uh, examine examination files. Then we choose a, a input for a, a output folder for the end of the analysis process. The extract reporting files in the output folder. The last we choose examination cases. Then our program is searched 
all of them uh, face examination cases to search it in input folder. Then we started the analyze process. Results in the study, a system was created that can be used for person identification in the analysis part of forensic evidence. The system which can perform face recognition with two different deep learning models. One of them face detection with YOLA version 5 model. Another is face recognition DGG face feature extraction model. The system which can perform face recognition with, I'm sorry, was later transformed into an interface that can be used by forensic experts. It seems that success of the face detection model is 91% from the results. The design of model has also been implemented to the mask cases. It also has been reached good performance values for them. For example, uh, there is my uh, covered face image and uh, our YOLA version 5 face detection model is detected all of these. Uh, what do you uh, future works to make the facial identification system more successful. Increase the amount of data set and searching multiple photos while searching for a person. For example, uh, this is Elon Musk photos matched with Elon Musk clear case first image, but Elon Musk photos is not matched with uh, Elon Musk's uh, sunglasses photos, uh, with mask photos, with head photos. Uh, what, should, what should we do? Uh, we Concrete the, uh, all of them very much photos uh, feature vectors and we obtain the average vector distance. Then uh, compare the animals photos and average vector distance uh, matches because uh, this this distance our threshold value is, is 0 0.4 under uh, this distance. Then what feature work? Uh, increasing the face recognition system by 60 FPS for real time. We want to do face recognition online, uh, then anonymizing the identification of extracted face features, thus to assure KBKK and GDPR in the face detection. Only features, uh, not photos of face, will be stored in the database for anonymization. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, any question? Thank you very much for your presentation. Next slide is we have two video presentations. Consists of reconnaissance, 
organization, delivery, supplementation, control and security, and maintenance inside that environment. We propose to use both methods to collect information to relate potential attacks. This would enable forensic investigators to configure logging services or use other methods to gather potential attack evidence for detailed analysis. Now, I will really follow this slide and be talking about the network. In this framework, all forensic information that includes evidence, expert knowledge, computer configuration, federal regulation and evidence, security policies, attack techniques, and access controllers related to the predicates, and reason by rule to construct that maximum. This framework has been useful in automating the evidence and providing a representation of how the attack happened. However, this framework requires manual collecting and pre-processing evidence, which is the reason why we propose using AI to collect and identify evidence. Reason has been used before to correlate evidence to create crime scenarios. In the field of digital forensics, Wang and Daniels 2008 described a fuzzy based correlated attack step substantiated by an agent's computer to nerves. The problem with the robot framework are when there is a lack of evidence which falls apart and there is no admissibility check. There is our framework of production. Our goal from this framework is to help and guide forensic investigators to identify evidence and to achieve this goal. We need to emulate the attack and know the attack steps without executing the attack. This diagram will explain how we can do this. As you can see, this framework consists of three phases. In phase one, we have previous attack reports, first security device, knowledge and configuration of the device, and formation to identity and security. Then move it to phase two, which will be pushing the more reports for its participators in relation. After that, we have phase three, as you can see, it's all about if the process is successful or not, if we succeed. Is there a new attack or can you identify evidence for forensic analysis? I'll explain that in phases and details of the following slides. Here is phase one, we name it as data forensic intelligence. In this case, we investigate the devices that may be connected to other device data. We will search about the device and gather all the information, including software, hardware, and existing vulnerability, both in hardware or software. We search external resources for obtaining information of devices, making them available to forensic examiners, such as previous attack robots, which are robots generated by renowned cybersecurity companies. We also have knowledge and configuration of the device, which will put the right configuration for the device so the attack can be successful. Information to ATT and CT. As you know, ATT and CT is a global access for knowledge based on adversary tactics and techniques based on real world observation. Moving on to phase two, we have been able to as a raw mining using the IIT. The main purpose of this phase is to use machine learning algorithms to predict those simulated potential attacks I talk about in phase one. And to do so, we need to use logic based reasoning to construct an AI based forensic investigation system. Here we use rule based reasoning to automate the attack simulation. A rule based reasoning system is mainly composed of predicates or rules that reason to find correlation between the grid. This is an example of a routine which applies to experience and CK, where the actions are written as a parameters. Propositions are written as a precondition representing the start states, and post condition representing post state after the actions have been executed. This is an example of our constructed way where we encode all facts to predicates including the conditions and post conditions as shown in the previous figure and we call actions to using quotes. This rule is in the form of a whole code. As you can see from the first slide, we have the post state, which is before the colon and dash symbol. Post state is the predicate before this symbol. And it's true only if what comes after this symbol is true too. Post state, which means the attacker has obtained privilege on the post. Pre-state includes the vulnerability together with the fact that can be used to exploit the vulnerability, which includes the configuration, security protocol, the privilege the attacker has, etc. In order to do that, we need to use machine learning algorithm to mine for rule and other model with the ILB. But before we talk about the ILB, I need to talk briefly about the ILB. ILB is a collection of techniques for constructing logic programs, for example. So if we have a set positive example and a set negative example, an ILB 
is a construct a logic program that implements all the positive examples but does not reveal any of the negative examples. The first use of IOP is that that definition can learn a program from a, a tiny handful of examples. So if you give it five examples, it can learn a program. Also, what's good is that it can learn a human readable and interpretable, which is very good because it's spit out like a human readable program. And it can generalize your outside the training that. So these are the good properties of IOP. On the other side, there is good qualities of it. It's how it handles the stable data. The main disadvantage of IOP system is their inability to handle noisy data. If the positive or negative examples contain any of the stable data, this system will not be able to learn that to the report. Your report learns a procedure for mapping tables to outputs. So the report generates the output from the input directly. The properties of neural network are not very data efficient because they need the massive number of examples for enabling the right kind of program that you want them to learn. Also, they are not interpretable. It's not a human readable output, so they cannot read it. Sometimes they generalize well outside their training data, but that's not guaranteed. However, they are very strong in terms of the other focus of this training data. As you can see from what I said previously, we can find this strength and weaknesses in both methods. So what we really want is that something that can satisfy all these requirements. We want something that's data efficient, interpretive, or generalized as well as strongest to misleading data and to ambiguous data. Therefore, the idea of the ILP has emerged, which is basically stands for differentiable inductive logic programming which attempt to combine the advantage of ILB with the advantage of the neural network. The ILB is a system that learn logic programs, specifically data learning programs, for example, also can handle these programs that contain robust data. Given some input or output example, there are general procedures for transforming inputs into human readable R. We are and we are going to use this flow to implement the forensic framework. After using the IRB to monitor for rules, the output rules will be examined and validated to make sure these rules are independent. A process that can help forensic examiners identify evidence. If the output results are not correct or meaningful enough, phase two of the machine learning algorithms is to be repeated, which can help examiner from evidence for identification. As for evaluation, we examine our framework by running this experiment. As you can see in this picture, our network environment is in the left-hand side. It shows a civilian system through which the attackers can access civilian cameras connected to a router and authenticate users using the web server, allowing them to visit the Google server at the back end. Suppose the attacker's target is to enter the building without allowing civilian cameras. In this case, the attack looks for vulnerability in the network and tries to create a possible attack path. To relate potential attack for this environment, we reverse engineer all connected devices in the network and combine their functionality and system configuration to this potential attack path, which is the goal of, of phase one in our frame. In our example, wireless security cameras from AWS TVs were connected to a mobile computer. The camera front and back shown on the right hand side of the picture allow developers to develop an object recognition system based on deep learning. By searching the internet, we found important hardware and software information about AWS TVs. For example, from its developer guide, we learned that its hardware is composed of the following components. It has uh, Intel Atom process for the CPU, uh, 8 gigabyte for the RAM memory, a boat operating system, 16 uh, gigab uh, gigabyte for uh, memory storage, Intel generation graphic engines, and others. Using the information from the previous which about AWS fitness hardware and software, a simple search can result in a vulnerability in the CPU hardware component and a vulnerability in the software component that can be used to attack the cameras. In addition, because deep learning use a deep learning technique to detect abnormal behavior, a capable attacker can easily fool the camera by providing false screening images. After completing phase one and collecting all important information regarding this IoT device and network environment, 
as it is so with the being necessary, we move to phase two, which handles constructing the logic rules. As we can see in this picture, the constructive rules for the AWS Windows Error interpreters. The first configuration predicate contains hardware vulnerability, and the second configuration predicate includes the software vulnerability. After that, we use the IRB to mine the source to generate the rewards. We transfer the input predicates to, to be the IRB friendly predicates. Following that, we run our experiment. In this picture, you can see the input and outputs for the DIRB system. The purpose of this experiment was to learn the predicate of executing code, which represents the target predicates. The user provided the input section in the left hand side of the picture. Also, include some positive examples, negative examples, and background knowledge. We include all the facts about this example that represent the configurations, such as the rules in the previous slide, which illustrate the different configuration, vulnerabilities in the predicates, and other. In our experiment, we limit the number of atoms in each predicate to two, and we chose the most significant variables to generate the most accurate rules. One of the solutions that the DIRB found is shown in the learning output section at the right hand side. This output shows a rule that can be used by the investigator for visual representation. This will help them identify where the evidence can be locked based on the new data rule. As a conclusion, this paper presented a framework that can help to investigators to determine what evidence should be locked for identification without executing the attack. To do this, we use the DIRB to generate the new rules, which can also be used later as a visualization technique to generate the data that the performance of work. However, there are several limitations to this research that can be addressed in the future work. The DIRB has some structural constraints, such as the number of additive the predicates. The DIRB requires predicates to have additives to or few. However, some rules have more than two arities in the predicate, especially complicated rules, and breaking them down into two arities is difficult. If we can solve this problem, it will be easier to use DIRP and then better new rules as a result, leading to improved attack scenarios. In addition, DIRP is a very expensive model because it spends from a lot of memory and takes a relatively long time to complete especially for complex environments. By overcoming these limitations in the future, for example, the investigator will be able to use this advanced technique in a variety of fields since it's advantageous to generate new rules of it. Here is my results. I thank you so much. Hi again, I'm presenting my second paper for today, which is an automated framework for generating the type graph using now security threads. Please feel free to contact me for any questions at this point. To start with, we all know that nowadays the ability to access to the internet is easily available. And this led to increase the number of devices connected to the internet. According to Cali 2020, the expected number of IoT devices will increase to 38.6 billion by 2025 and then to 50 billion by 2030. For example, smart homes and watches are becoming attached to the individual's personal life inside and outside the home. The huge increase in the number of devices connected to the internet required the development technologies to keep track and account for these devices and their users. As a result of this growth, the collected number of devices and the new technology development, this creates important security issues, especially in the communication process. Many wireless devices, such as various cameras, lighting systems, and sensors, are connecting to cloud-based services. Also, some of IoT devices are just plugged and play. These IoT devices have a limitation in computing power and depends on the cloud-based services. This makes these devices easily hacked and cause disruptions. The Morai, for example, happened in 2016. A college student created a simple malware that exploited and matched IT devices, such as IP cameras and home routers, 
to launch and distribute the United Service attacks against some of the service providers all over the world. From this example, we can know that the attacks on the IP devices are large and more vulnerable to complex attack. Also, the scope of vulnerability is changed quickly in terms of the method of attack and impact. So, the security professionals need to have a conceptual understanding of the devices they are working on in order to respond promptly to the challenges in the IoT devices. Moving on to the biggest work, the one that has in 2015, who bought the Forensic Awareness Method Things model, which is a centralized evidence repository that makes evidence collecting and analysis more efficient. And the system can be accessible for any IoT device that registered with the service. Some of the functionality protected evidence preservation, secure provenance, access evidence through API. These APIs can only be accessed by the court and forensic investigators. This model has been such because they do not provide a comprehensive solution that address all aspects of digital forensics. Also, it's still limited in terms of IoT scenarios, definition, and evidence source identification. Many researchers, for example, Kibanda Ray 2016 proposed an IoT framework for digital forensics and investigation. And the main purpose is to expand their investigation capabilities. But unfortunately, most of the work was introductory and was done on a high level basis. For that reason, we propose our framework, the online for the multi finder, which is a customized search tool that focuses on the component utilized to build IoT or IoT devices. Also providing information on IT or IT infrastructure, so the system should cover user existing exposures and vulnerabilities in IT or IT gadgets. Basically, the tool utilizes existing world information about a certain device to reveal most weaknesses related to possible attacks. We propose a tool which can provide users with the most recent vulnerability from reliable vulnerability databases and will help to generate attack graphs by using model. Here is our framework description. The architecture starts with collecting common vulnerabilities from different databases as an input for our known vulnerabilities, which represent the vulnerabilities that the user is searching for. These known vulnerabilities and interaction rules are used as an input for mobile tool in order to generate a pattern graph. As for the interaction rules, they contain a general attack techniques, rules for method configuration, and others. OVF utilizes local, which is an end-to-end -end framework, a reasoning system that can conduct multi-host, multi-state vulnerability analysis on a network to generate a visual representation of all possible paths of attack against the network, presenting a state where an attacker has successfully completed an attack. Here is our main menu. The tool is online, which means users must be connected to the internet in order to use it. It can retrieve data from many sources, ensuring that if a new vulnerability for a new device is discovered, all the app will be able to retrieve it. So it turns the result for the users who will pick up just the relevant for pages in one place. To the device that the users are interested in or the key terms that they type, it contains from six components, as you can see. The first three components of the tool are user manual, hardware, and software retrieved from the web crawler. The user manual component will display a user manual for the item that you are looking for. Users will be able to access all pages with the detailed instructions for the tool search platform. Web crawling is a key strategy for collecting data and the continually increasing contents of the internet and keeping up with it. All search engines use web crawlers to index the content of the search engines and get the data from the web. Here is the hardware components will retrieve and present all pages with information about an IT or IT device's hardware specification. For example, the type and size of the CPU, RAM, and other hardware important details that the user is looking for. Here is the software components will provide users with software details about the certain item. It will provide web pages which include type of operating system and external related applications and others. Software data is very important for users in the IT or IT devices. For vulnerability and the references components, we'll target all the reliable databases that hold information about any known vulnerabilities. The tool will do the searches for the users in different vulnerability databases, then present all the web pages that are related to the device name and key. 
data. Some of the examples of the vulnerability databases, National Vulnerability Database, Software Engineering Institute, CERT Coordination Center, Common Vulnerabilities and Exposure, Common Weakness in Relation. Reference components. Here, the user will find the pages that contain all the details about the vulnerabilities, such as the risk about this vulnerability, how this vulnerability is exploited, what was the solution, and others. As for the attack graph component, the OVF utilized Mobile Tool to generate the attack graph. We created the graphical user interface form for Mobile Tool, which allowed the user to choose the rules from a set of interaction rules, which are reasoning rules for Mobile. Then the user should complete the form with the configuration data, such as host and liquid configuration, vulnerability description, and other important data, which represent the input file for Mobile in order for the user to generate the attack graph. Here you can see all the possible attack paths for this example. As for evaluation, we examined our framework by doing two different evaluation methods. First, running three different scenarios to predict an attack in the same network environment. In this method, we used our OVF noun vulnerabilities and model to show our three scenarios and generate attack graph. Second, we evaluate our OVF tool itself by using usability study. As you know, usability test is an important feature for any technical product since it indicates how well it can be used by the intended consumers or users. Usability test is necessary to help in detecting any problems in the design and identifying any possibility for development or improvement. Starting with the first method of evaluation, which is the evaluation scenarios. Here is the network environment of our three scenarios. In this network diagram, there are two firewalls. External firewalls controls network access from the internet to that enterprise network. Internal firewall controls network access to the database servers and workstation within the enterprise network. Also, the network environment contains a web server which is responsible for accessing internet users, a database server, and a workstation including a PC machine and camera system. For the time purpose, I will only be able to explain the work one scenario. Before I start talking about the first scenario, I need to explain the shapes that you see in that type of graph. So, the rectangle will represent the system configuration, including the software vulnerabilities, while diamond represents the privilege which the attacker can gain by exploiting the vulnerabilities. The oval links the precondition to the post condition for each step of the attack scenario. In the first scenario, the attacker goal is to launch a SQL injection attack on the vulnerable web server. The attacker also attempts to execute malicious code in the database server by taking an advantage of the server's open internet access to exploit the vulnerable database software, which allows privilege escalation. As you can see in the attack graph, there are 17 nodes to illustrate the first scenario. The node 11 display the attacker from the internet. While nodes 10 and 15 show that the attacker can access a web server through port 80 and database server through port 1521. Based on the preconditions, node 9 and 14, the attacker can see two paths. For the first path, the attacker can remotely support the web server through TCP protocol at port 80 by exporting the vulnerability in node 13 and its network configuration in node 12, including node 6 and 7. Node 5 shows that the web server uses the TCP protocol to commit to the database server through port 1521. On the second path, the database server can be accessed from the internet in the node 14, so the attacker can launch an attack to the database server directly or through the web server from the node 4, including node 3, 16, 17, 2, and 1. What we want to talk about the second method of evaluation, which is the usability study. This method is all about a researcher asking qualified participants to complete tasks utilizing the tool and then observe, observing and gathering feedback on their activities. We decided to use usability study for the OVF tool in order to determine its usability and suitability for security specialists like forensic investigators. As for the methodology, we use system usability scale, which is an affordable and effective method for testing a product's usability. The SAS score range from 0 and desirable to 100 desirable. Other than the system usability, we ask participants about the frequency of searching for devices' vulnerabilities and their preferred searching methods to learn more about their usage and how might to improve the tool. 
The respondents also rated their overall experience regarding the system effectiveness, operability, learnability, and understandability. The usability test study was divided into two phases to reach to accurate outcome. Phase one, a biot survey was given to some graduate students specializing in digital forensics programs. These survey questions were revised and modified based on the finding of the biot study. Phase two, main survey. We targeted, we targeted more participants, especially people who are working in the field. The reason of this expansion was made to establish a comparison between groups and in regard to the evidence base of interaction with the system. The purpose of this study was explained to, the, to, to these participants before starting the system. The participants walked into activity, beginning with exploring the tool and executing tasks using the system. The purpose of this activity was to measure performance, success, or failure by performing a series of actions that exemplify the system primary functions. The participants were also asked about their opinions of the complexity of activities and the possible source of confusion. Lastly, a usability testing form was completed to measure the operation of the system's usability. Moving we'll on to talk about the results of the usability study. After calculating the participant usability success scores, the results showed that the average system rating is 74.53, which indicates that the OVF tool has a high acceptance level. Regarding the frequency of session for vulnerabilities, the results showed that 94% of the participants reported that they searched for potential vulnerabilities. Also, 75% of the participants said that they targeted vulnerability databases for their investigations, and the other 25% were using online search engines. Searching for vulnerability in IoT environment is a fundamental part of the digital forensic process. Also, 82% of participants strongly agreed that the tool has a high understandability, suggesting that users can easily and adequately to understand the software applicability and logical concept. Similarly, 82% of participants strongly agreed with the tool's learnability, meaning that users can rapidly comprehend how to use it and figure out its key features. Lastly, 62% of the participants agreed about the system attractiveness, suggesting that it's a user friendly. Overall, almost all of the participants reported that yeah, the tool achieved its primary goal in that the OVF is both usable and suitable. Well, as a conclusion, the current paper presents an automated framework for threat modeling and risk assessment in IT or IT systems and the usability of the OVF tool. The results from the survey and such assessment reveal that the system is sufficiently attractive, operable, learnable, and understandable within an average SAS rating and within the acceptable range. This paper creates several potential areas for future research. So forensic investigators agree that creating forensic aware IoT is important in preventing attacks. Thus, the proposed OVF tool should be analyzed regarding its relevance and benefits in the forensic aware IoT environment. Further research should also determine the tool's efficiency in the changing IT security landscape, especially with attackers finding more and more creative methods to bypass the developed solutions. Here is my differences, and thank you so much for listening. Thank this uh, concludes the session. Thank you for your participation. After the coffee break, the third part will continue. Thank you. Şey yapıyor mu şu an? Bak, ben Yok, ondan geleyim de senden devralayayım diye. Tamam. Ee, süre akıyor mu şu an? Şey. Bak böyle. Ya zaten şey oluyor. Şu havasını çalışıyor. Şurada şey yapıyorsun. Şey yok yani. Sağ olasın. Sen ne kadar yapıyorsun? Mesela ya. 
Şu an sorgulamadan önce bir konuşunca şu şekilde sunuma başlayınca işte direkt sunuma yaklaştık. Zaten online oldu. Yani konuşmacı sadece ses yani Konuşmacı olduğu zaman şey yaparsın. Böyle yaparsın. Bu kadar. Burada görebileceğin en saçma iş bu arada. Gerçekten mi? Kaç? Ben kaç yıldır bu Ağustos 2019. 2,5 yıldır. Gerçekten. Kaç yıldır Yok yani şu defa böyle bir şey ilk defa. Daha kadar yaptığımız en saçma iş. Herhalde sekreter kıldır bakalım. Birkaç kere emrana çıktığım an işte boşta kalmak gerçek bir yerdir. Nasıl gerek çok iş olmuyor da hani telefona bakmak gerek. Öyle bir şey olabilir. Tercih günlerinde olur. Tercih günlerinde olur. Tercih günlerinde olur. Tanıtım günlerinde olur. Her gün olmasa da işte dönüşüm bir şekilde tanıtım günlerinde olur. Yani size denk gelmez de bana birkaç kere denk geldi. Erkek olduğum için bu taşıma işi denk geldi. İşte hocalar taşımıyor bana. Biraz da şey böyle. Ama size aradığınızı dinleyebilir miyim? İşte olabiliyor. Bazen öyle şey. Aynı zamanda hocalar olacak. Güzel bir yaşlı konuşuyorlar. Bazen böyle tarifte bulunabiliyor. Böyle bir şey. Onlar için öyle çok idari görevi yok. Arayla arkadaşlar var. İdari çok fazla görev görüyor. Ya diyorum mezun öğrencilerin dafası gelecek. Gidiyor, gidiyor onlar uğraşıyor. İşte mezun öğrenciler ne yapıyor? Mesela geçen hafta onunla uğraşıyoruz. Bir Adamı iş gitmemiş ama tam çıkarken 200 tane işler yok. İyi şartlar var. Mevzu öğrenci şu an işte ne yaşlar yok. Harika bir rapor hazırlanacak. Rapor hazırlanacak. Yok rapor o giriyor. Yani orta oluyor. Gidi arkadaşlar var. Böyle de ikiler daha iyi. Ben de ama şöyle bir defa bizim tek bir bölüm var. Atıyorum. Sen de ayrı bir halde şu an işte ikisi böyle bir bölüm var. Böyle de o kadar bir bölüm var. İnşaatta yorum arkadaşlar. Daha neyse. Yani Amerikalı proje yapmış. Atıyorum. Bir tarafta bakarsan normal maaşın üstüne bile yine kalıyor. Şöyle dediğim gibi bölümüne göre değişir. Bizim bölümümüzde e, teorik çok fazla bir şey yapamaz. Yani, laboratuvar kullanmak gerekiyor. Laboratuvarımız var bizim bölüm olarak. Biz kullanmıyoruz. Size laboratuvar çok yok var mı? Var. Sizdeki gibi daha şey yapmışız. Son işte başka şeyler yapıyoruz. Test var. Bunlar var. Yani mankarda zaten var ama mesela bir bir şey var. Kullanılıp beşten sonra elektrik yapıyoruz. Ama kimin testler var. 24 saat yapılması var. Dedim ki bu Araştırma namına pek bir şey yok. Bir proje yürütüyordur, onu bilmem. Ya biraz talepler de yalan yok. Mesela ben iki buçuk sene bulundayım. İki buçuk sene içerisinde yani şu bir takla başvuru yapmıyorum mesela. Kapıra alınmadı. Hocalar şey demişti, sen yürüyorsun. Uygun gönüllerse oluyor. Dedim ki bu hocalar da ayakkabı ama okulda da ayakkabı mesela okul. Sen ben önce gelmiştim. Baba direkt dedi falan. Maddi olarak eskiden çok daha iyi. Gözümüzde 10 yıl aşkı programlarımız var. Yaklaşık 10 yıl. 10 yıl civarında programlarımız çok inşallah. Bir de kadar ayırmadılarsa bir de seviyede tatlı var. İş bizim yapacağımız bir iş değil. Bunu neden söylemiyoruz? <gülüyor> bunu oturduğumuz zaman konuşulur. Şöyle de normalde. 
Ya hiyerarşik olarak aslında topluluk var biraz. Onunla da alakalı. Yapacak adam var. Yetişim kontrolüsünden bir gram ne olmuş? Çarpı olmuş. Çarpı olmuş. Hocalara gelip normalde şunu diyebilirim. Ya öyle de işte biz ne anlatıyoruz? Işte, gelsin bir de yapsın. O da gidecek ama yetişim kontrolüsü. Onlar için bir kameraman varsa ki yok ama. Ve alt yapı eksikli var işte. Sen böyle bir organizasyon yapıyorsun. Sandalye koymak mı oluyor sadece? Bir tane teknik başlığı koyarsın işte. Ya da şuraya koyarsın. Kapıyor öğrenci. Ne yapıyorsun? Ne yapıyorsun? Toplan, toplan. Çalıştı. Orada kendi aramızda çok konuşuruz. Mümkün olduğu şey yapmama tarafları. Yani kopuk hareket etmiyor. Yani şöyle. İşte 9 kişi. Önce çok daha kalabalık. 12 kişi. Sıraya kalabalık. Herkes bak şimdi şunu biliyoruz. Özellikle reklamlık seviyesinde ama teker teker düşünceleri geri dile getirmek çok mantıklı olmuyor. Çok sessizlik oluyor. Kendi aramızda çok sessiz olur ki farklı görüş olur. Bunu bir de getirdim ama çok iyi bir şeyler anlıyor. Ben savunduğum bir şey değil. Ben tek bir, mesela Nur Ayçin var. Tek olarak bir insan önce yapıp böyle yapılır ya da yapılmaz diye konuşmak. Bu çok doğru. Bence de mantıklı değil. Ama tabii ben de şey olunca bu sayede daha olmaz zor. Sizin bir dakika ayda dersiniz var. Bizde dersi olan bu var. Ben de testleyim mesela. Denk getirme kolay oldu. Beril doktor olsun diye teslim etmiyoruz. Ne denk getirme? Getirmeye çalışıyorum. Aslında yarın olur mu? Bu olmasa yarın toplanabilir. Yani bir dakika ayda sayede ama olmadı. Yine bu hafta hiç ayarlamaya çalışıldı mı bilmiyorum ama şöyle, gözünün o kadar korkutmasın bu ilk defa böyle saçma bir şey değil. Yani bu şahit aslında. Ben hatırlamıyorum. Ha şu eskiden de saçma şeyler olabiliyormuş. Çok eskiden. Eskiden de kastım. Dört yıl olması falan. Dört inşaat var. Dört inşaat var. Hemen hemen hepimiz aynı zaman gidiyoruz. Hepimiz. Hiç yani sadece benim fikrim değil. Dört olmamızın nedeni İngilizce, Türkçe falan. Tabii ki İngilizce de, iki Türkçe de. Ben ve Nelim Türkçe'deyiz. Bunlar da Caner. Evet, yani şey de vardı. Endüstrilerinin Türkçesi vardı. Bitti o kapan. Elektrik de kapanmış. Onları mezun etmeye çalışıyordu. Mezun ettiler. Ama e, şu an zaten teknik değil. Diğer bir gece var. Diğer de... Rasistan sayısı da çok alt değil mi? İçeride yokmuş bir şey. İçeride yokmuş bir şey. Gelmiyorlar zaten. Bilgisayara çıkıyorlar bu arada. Bilgisayar altta ilanlar tek şeyde çıkıyor. Yani, yeah. Ama bilgisayar olamazsın. Elektrik direktörü çıkıyor. Elbisleri bile çıktılar. Gelmiyor yani, insanlar. Yani. Yani, yani, aslında benim bir arkadaşımın arkadaşı vardı. O da iyice bir yıldızı mevcut. Hatta işte şey değil. Türk vatandaşı değil. Ama yani, kabul etmedi. Yani. Aslında yani, ben istediğim bir bilgisayara gelmesi. Kapıda olmaz. İnsan kaynaklarına sordum. Hatta gerçekten ciddi gelmeyi düşünüyordu. Bizi de rahatlatırdı yani. Onunla uğraşma. İlkaya söyleme onu. Nevin Hoca'ya söyledim. Nevin Hoca'ya söyledim. Ben benim için sinirlendim. Hatta özür dilerim. Ben de söyledim. Şöyle İlkada çalışabiliyor. Bir kere çalışabilir. Neyi çalışabilir? İranlı Hoca'ya söyledim. Evet. Sana şey sanırım araştırma görevlisi yani herhalde yabancı. O da olabilir. Öyle şöyle. Hoca olabiliyorsunuz. Benim eşim bak bunu yaştırsın. Ben adam. Ondan nasıl bir şey ama sıkıntı. Gerçekten. Kamuda olamaz. Şey, buradaki iş kanunu değişikliği bilmem ne olmuş o kadar da bilemem. Yani, normalini söylüyorum. Normalde olabilir. Mısırlı tanıdığım var. Ben de öyle biliyorum. Arel'de olması lazım. İran'da yine bir İslam var. Arel'de. Ya şöyle, ya uyuru yabancı ama sonuçta yıldızda okum. Yani Türkçe biliyordu ki herkes. Şöyle buradaki İK çok bir şey bilmez. Ama bana kesinlikle böyle bir şey olmayacağını, yani kendi ciddi ciddi girmeyi düşünüyordu yani. Şöyle, normalde şimdi referansını ilk açıyor. Ben öyle anladım. Neyin hocaya da sordum. Benim hocam bilmemesi normal. Şey dedi, hani öğren bana sorarsın dedi, söylersin dedi, ben öyle hareket ettim dedi. İlk açıyor çünkü, iş, iş söyleyebilirsin ama ilk açıyor sadece imzalatıyor. 
eğer yüzük bir rakam alınacak bir dosya bir rakam bir rakam bir rakam bir rakam bir rakam bir rakam bir rakam bir kimle uğraşarsın onu öğrenmek lazım ee, en mantıklısı o İK söyler belki yani hem bizim için iyi olur yani birinin gelmesi nasıl değişmiştir belki bir ihtimal değişmiştir bunu bilmiyorum bir araştırsak ya da bilen var mıdır çünkü yani hani dediğim gibi sınav açıldı ya o an ilan açıldı gelmeyi düşünüyordum bana sordular başvurmadan önce ben de öyle bir bilgi olunca hiç başvurmadı yani. Siz de bu arada kahve ne Thank <laughs> you. 
Olmasına en iyi şey ne? Öğren. Bir şey. Bir şey. Bir şey. Bir şey. Bir şey. Bir şey. Bir şey. Bir şey. Bir şey. Bir şey. Bir şey. Bir şey. Bir şey. Bir şey. Bir şey. Bir şey. Bir şey. Bir şey. Bir Kötü bir şey söyledim ben. Mustafa keşke. Senin nasıl ne? Evet. Gazi mi? Gazi mi? Gazi mi? Gazi mi? Gazi mi? Bence iktisat derdimlerde değil. Tıpkı güzel olan. Tıpkı da arkadaşlarım var mı? Yani. Burada nerede olsun? Bilmiyor musun? Şeyde, ne? Elektron. İlgi ve haberleşim. O şey, hangi bölümde? Şey, evet. Elektron, haberleşim. İlişim ve resim. İlişim ve resim. Ben aslında biraz şey kayabilirsin. Yazılım mı? Evet, kayabilirsin aslında. Evet. 
Burada yapmanız bilmiyorum ama geçiş olarak olmalısın. Bir süre buna takılırsın. Buranın iş yolunu çok çok yok. Sizin sadece dönem çok var mı bilmiyorum ama. Dönem yoktu. Düz dönem 7 laf var. Aynen. Cihaz günde 20, 22, 22 şeklinde diyor. Haftada 20 saat falan baba giriyordu yanlış hatırlamıyorum. Hep de benim ikisi olan da yani bir ders dönemi devam ediyor. Ona göre ayarlamıyorlar. İşte. Bize göre ayarlamıyorlar işte. Yok yok. Ama şöyle, bak mesela diğer taraftan, sen şu an kaçıncı dönemde? İkinci dönemde. Geride kaç ders vermiş şu an? Yani bunu geçersem dört dersim kalacak. İki dönem dört dersim kalacak. Sen de ya üç bir yapacaksın. Evet, biraz uzayacak benim. Biraz değil de, dört dönem var. İki dönemde kalacak. Bir yıl lazım diyoruz. Şey, ders için diyoruz. Ders için. İki yıl, evet. Sen başlat şu an. Hello again. We want to remind you that there are two parallel sessions running at this time. Besides this, there is also a Zoom session in progress. You can look at the symposium program for the details. And now the topic is cybersecurity. Professor Dr. Esar Gül will moderate presentations. Please. Welcome to this afternoon session, cybersecurity presentation. Uh, do I need this? Yeah, anyway, anyway uh, I don't like these microphones. Uh, so, first paper is uh, Machine Learning Based uh, Security Solutions for Critical Cyber Physical Systems. Shahzade uh, Neman, please. So we have to finish in maximum 15 minutes, including questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Shahzad Ahmad and I'm working as a professor in the University of Saint Pakistan. Uh, and thank you for the conference organizers. They gave me a chance to uh, present my paper here and to introduce the different academic, academics from around the world. Uh, this is the research paper, which is uh, one of my PhD students. He started now uh, his research. So we, uh, we prepare one paper and we are presenting in this conference. Uh, the title of this uh, his research is basically he's looking for uh, machine learning based security solutions uh, for the critical cyber physical systems. So these are the contents of presentation. Uh, I will start with uh, the abstract and then introduction and what we are contributing in this paper. And we will talk about something about critical cyber physical systems, what they are and why the security is important in these systems and then continue. It mostly based on the literature. So when we talk about the cyber uh, the physical systems, they are basically the complex uh, infrastructure, uh, and they actually are providing some services which uh, you know people and government are relying, like, including it include the transportation, it include the smart uh, energy systems, it also includes the uh, Internet of Things, and then also they have a you know, other important like water control systems. So these are all the systems which are now connected to the internet and all the companies, all the government services, they, they monitor these systems through those, uh, uh, you know, the cyber physical systems. But they are critical because if any service will disrupt, it will disrupt the human lives as well, including like healthcare or if there's a failure in the power plants, it may be stopped. The, our production to the systems and then attacks, cyber attacks on those systems will really create a mess. Many examples happened in the past, which we already mentioned in this paper. And the, recently, the most of these, uh, you know, the, the cyber physical systems has increased around the world. Most of the governments has planned to switch to the digital, uh, you know, the systems to transfer because they want to be 
uh, more efficient system. So this become essential to be switch on these systems. And now uh, further in these systems, they are basically combination of hardware and software. So they are not just only require the security of the software, but you know the vulnerabilities of the uh, hard, uh, hardware level are also increasing capability. And there are various attacks which happen, and you know these attacks will be based on uh, the hardware, they breach the hardware security as well. So this domain actually covers the all uh, areas of the security, most of the areas of the security. Now, uh, what we have done in this paper, we actually made a survey where we talked about the, how to make, how to improve the security of these systems or what the researchers are working on it. Uh, and they are based on deep learning and machine learning based solution, which are basically the artificial intelligence techniques uh, for the mitigation of cyber threats. And then uh, it, it also, the purpose of this paper is to, if anyone who is doing research on this area, he or she has the idea about that, what kind of techniques are available which can be used and ready used and you know, they can be further tested, they can be further modified and can be used uh, as, as our future requirement. Now, this is one example that when we look at any uh, cyber critical physical system, they are basically in three layers. So one is the application layer, the second is the transmission layer, and third is the perception layer. Now, in perception layer, we have always the interfaces, our sensors, our, uh, you know, which is basically the user side. And the second in the transmission layer, we have the connectivity through the different uh, networks, it might be 5G cloud, it's Wi Fi, and then we have a third layer which we call the application. So, where we can see the things are running through those, uh, you know, the, uh, the layers, these two layers when the perception layer and transmission layer. So, always the, the system work in these layers. So, the possibility of uh, attack is, uh, you know, on every layer. So every layer is uh, must need to be protected. So in a perception layer, because it's used to collect the data, and that's also known as the sensing layer. And you know these IoT devices, the sensors, the uh, you know the RFID tags, GPS systems, they are also used. They are using as a part of perception layer, and they actually are exposed to physical attacks, such as like physical damage to sensors or you know, reconfiguration of the RFID sensors and, you know, uh, to change certain operations of the actuators. Uh, so in that way, the perception layer is certain, uh, you know, the, the limits which actually can be reached by these actuators. Now, the transmission layer is a transportation layer which actually provides the connectivity to the system. It includes uh, the information, uh, you know, transmit the transmit information over that layer. So they, they have like uh, connected with the local area networks with Wi-Fi, 4G, 5G, Bluetooth, cloud, and much more. So this transmission layer is uh, can be vulnerable from the various side. And some example of those attacks are like denial of services, especially distributed denial of services, which is going to very common. And data poisoning and man in the middle attack. These are the very common attacks which happen in the transmission layer. And then at the application layer, uh, there is also uh, you know, some kind of attacks which can be enabled or disabled the devices, uh, and they can be changed the device status and something which the you know in this layer we have also spyware and cyber attacks as well. So the application layer is also very sensitive. Uh, this is just one example. If we have a monitoring system in our hand, which we have an IoT based system, which tells us the air quality uh, in any area, in uh, one city especially. So that's one example of a very critical cyber system. Now, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, category, we have basically select the cyber physical systems, which are basically is going to be our is. The more of the most of the researchers are focusing. It includes smart homes, smart water treatment systems, smart cars, uh, and you know smart wear management. So the word smart when it started, it becomes the the more you know the use of these uh, 
uh, system. Now, uh, I'm just coming to be the what techniques are available in the literature to prevent it. They are based on uh, conventional, convolutional neural networks and deep neural networks and deep belief networks. So these all are the artificial intelligence based techniques which are actually somehow uh, using to uh, are somehow proposed to pro to protect the cyber systems from these attacks. But there are still uh, limitations with these techniques so which needs to be addressed. And as the AI is emerging into the cyber physical systems, it's creating another challenge of the security. So once we will be in the age of artificial intelligence, then, then the challenges will be entirely different. So these are the, already the researchers are working, but still we said there is a room, there is a lot of uh, gaps which we have to cover. And we have to develop some more uh, techniques uh, which can be protect the, the, these systems at hardware and software level. Now uh, it can be, uh, uh, you know, these uh, something which we say that we use different algorithms in uh, machine learning and deep learning. So the people who are working in the field up here, they are very familiar with the SVM, logistic regression, naive, scan, and random forest. These are certain algorithms which we use to train the machine, and then we have a deep learning, uh, you know, the uh, CNN and R and, and deep belief networks. So these are very common uh, deep learning algorithms which use in the cyber physical system security. <laughs> Now, uh, in this table, uh, we discuss about the data sets because when you want to train these algorithms, you should have a knowledge about the, the data sets which are available. So, there are some data, data sets which are available for the training purpose. It includes uh, SWET, Gaze Pipeline, UH Strike Set, Tone IoT, which is for the internet uh, industrial things. And then we have a SWAT, which is uh, for the industrial control system. So these all are the data sets which are available and can be used further for the training purpose. We actually we started to work on drone IoT because the focus is on industrial, uh, to secure the industrial internet of things, which is uh, because the industries are, uh, is now going completely you know, smart and there's no human intervention. So. So the tone IoT uh, at least provide a beginning of it. So we started to work from that data set. And there is also need of the further data sets as well to, to do research in this area. Now these are some uh, references. So we have just review the what's going on in this area and how it can be challenged, what challenges it will bring in the future. And as a beginner of the researchers, so that we give awareness about this. And uh, any questions you have? Any questions on the floor? Uh, so I have one question. Yes. So, uh, so there are there are three layers, but we are going to run your machine learning algorithms on application layer. Yes. Can I turn on the? Yeah, basically the uh, when we look at on these are three layers. So these all three layers are vulnerable. And what I said, because the, when the hardware is using the CPS are physically, uh, all the layers are possible to be obtained. But at, at this point, we are just talking about the, the machine algorithm which run at that layer. But still, uh, someone can be research on the protection of the perception layer and where, where it is needed. Maybe artificial intelligence, you, know, you, can, you have to search in hardware. We have to develop with that embedded, you know, the intelligence which can automatically, you know, detect that. Well. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Our second paper, detecting uh, Arabic, YouTube spam using data mining techniques. This is going to present on the Turkish author, yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes.
السلام عليكم. Okay, uh, my name is Yahya Tashkush. I am from Georgia University of Science and Technology in Georgia, Bordeaux. Okay, um, this research is part of uh, one of the graduate courses that I, I, I am teaching. So my student uh, tried to find how to apply this idea by predicting Arabic YouTube spam using data mining technique. I'll go first in the agenda, short introduction, objective. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the data set, then very long, and the summary. Uh, initially, what's this spam? We have to know what's this spam to find it, to detect it, and to classify it. Any comment aim to propagate virus or malware. Uh, also, any comment contains commercial advertising or any act that misleads the user away from the actual content of the video. So this is one of the definition for the spam. Based on that, our objective to detect these kind of spams, especially in Arabic comments, uh, and we apply five. Uh, well-known classification algorithms, the near-based algorithm, KML, support vector machine, decision tree, and the random forest algorithm. And this is on the right side, it's just a sample or example of the spam comments. Uh, the data set is collect collected using two tools. The first one is the tube spam, the second is YouTube uh, comment scrub. The data set after removing uh, what is not necessary of these comments, we have 40k and we classified them in four categories. The four categories are political, educational, entertainment, and sport areas. And the experiment took place by using Wicca 3.8 the initial we met the free processing uh, phase by, uh, and we apply it on the data set by filtering the Arabic step words, recognizing them, and stemming. Then we apply the five classified algorithm on the data set. Then finally we have the evaluation models uh, uh, by applying tenfold cross validation, which is the standard in most of the, these uh, tools, to find out the best accuracy between these five classification algorithms. Based on our data set, the first domain is what you are hidden behind the clock. Okay, so I think it's the political domain. Okay. The political domain, we got the best accuracy by using the support per machine, which is 8726. And uh, the rest of the algorithms were this than that. Uh, here we have a special case for the education domain. We got the random forest with 91.4 percentage, which is the highest. Uh, between the five classification algorithm, especially for the education domain, and I'll tell you after at the end why it's the highest. The result shows that at the sport, uh, sport domain, also the support vector machine got the higher accuracy, which is 88.3. Uh, finally, the entertainment domain, we got the accuracy 78.4 by using the support vector machine. Uh, at the end, we can summarize the result by saying that support vector machine algorithm has achieved the best accuracy value for political entertainment and sport, uh, sport domain. The random forest achieved the best accuracy value for the educational domain because and we think uh, the, the users who 
write comments in the application domains are not regular uh, as the other users. So we can say that due to the limited number of spam words that appear on regular basis, that they repeat the same comment. Most likely, when we have education area, they keep repeating the same comments. But unlike other domains that have varying spam words. And thank you very much. Any question? Thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir. I would have expected the simple native based algorithm to perform very well. That was not the case. It's actually shows up only in this case, and the only difference in the data set, I'm sorry, the only difference between the author the four domains is that the limited number of the spam type or the limited number of the spam comments. And we think it's due to the uh, due to this issue of the random files got the best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any other questions? No? Thanks. Thank you. Our third presentation will be online. Not a for target specific APT attacks. Misusing Google Teach Information. Uh, hello, Professor Gul. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I'm not able to see the slides. Okay. So, can you see my slides? Yeah, I can stop now. Yeah. Yes, so, I can see the presentation as well. Okay. Shall I go ahead? Uh, please. Okay. Hello everyone, uh, this is Venkat Sai Charan and I'm a PhD scholar from the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, IIT Kanpur, India. So this is a joint work uh, in collaboration with my fellow researchers, Mr. Mohan Anand, Navin Selwal and Rishikesh Chunduri under the guidance of Professor Sandeep Kumar Shukla. So this is the high level agenda for the next 15 minutes. First of all, I will explain about what is advanced persistent threats and uh, then we will look into the life cycle phases and uh, then we will look into the how these uh, APT groups are moving towards the smart malware principles to perform the targeted attacks. Then we will look into the problem statement followed by our DartMuck threat model. So in order to make this threat model realizable, uh, we have performed five different experiments. So we'll go through those results and the analysis part as well. And towards the end, I will discuss some uh, highlights like uh, why this dot more kind of attack detection will become difficult in the real time scenarios and what is the role of you know the facial or voice data in apt attacks and what are all the other alternatives to this uh, teachable machine then in summary i will conclude this talk uh, by highlighting some future directions as well so let's get started so in general uh, traditional malware uh, targets a wide range of users with a predefined behavior but whereas the advanced persistent threats will try to stay low in the system and performs very targeted attack, end-to-end uh, -end targeted attack without leaving any traces. So they have a set of uh, stages in their kill chain and uh, starting from the initial compromise phase to the data exfiltration phase. And they used to grab the payloads, uh, which are lightweight for a specific users to exfiltrate the sensitive data. So. Recently, the uh, targeted malware uh, mutated itself and become much more sophisticated uh, by using the smart malware principles. So the smart malware principles are like goal oriented. So the malware has a primary goal and a secondary goal. And they used to, uh, the malware used to interact with uh, several complex, uh, uh, you know, system level uh, programs to deceive the chain of defenses and it, they construct multilingual payloads and they will dynamically adapt the TTPs based on situation. So because of this evolution in smart malware principles, the more number of act APT actors are moving towards the smart malware principles to design a, so, a much more robust and uh, sophisticated payloads to achieve the persistence. 
so the ref, uh, recent example was the refresh internal uh, refresh internals method uh, in the solar winds attack so which is a, a real example for this uh, latest smart malware trend across the globe so as we discussed uh, uh, recently some of the state sponsored groups like uh, lazarus group from the north korea they are also using uh, legitimate services like github and onedrive as a part of their uh, attack campaigns and also they are using the legitimate windows uh, microsoft binaries uh, called lolbins uh, living offline binaries to perform their final payload execution to propagate their attack chains so keeping all these things in mind uh, the usage of this legitimate services will further entangle the detection of this targeted malware as the apt actors are using this smart malware principles to perform the targeted attacks uh, usually in general the threat models are uh, you know uh, discussed in a wide range to uh, find out such kind of unimagined situations for example you know post 911 attack Uh, us state department of homeland security called all the hollywood actors and the producers and the directors to you know come up with a uh, threat models that that might possible in the near future so given the vulnerabilities of this uh, apt groups we thought that it's a time for you know coming up with the various threat models which may not be considered in the uh, previous risk assessors or the you know security architects uh so with this intention we have designed a specific threat model for target specific attacks misusing the legitimate uh, services called uh, google teachable machine so we mainly concentrate on establishing foothold lateral movement and the data exfiltration phases of advanced persistent threats in this model so we have performed five different experiments to demonstrate how the attacker can pull various payloads to perform the targeted attacks and we have evaluated those you know Uh, performance of those uh, experiments in terms of target prediction confidence and the payload deployment time as well so finally once the payload got downloaded uh, we have executed those payloads by using a uh, lol bin um, called script runner which stays uh, which is a legitimate uh, application stays in the machine uh, uh, developed by the microsoft so to uh, achieve the persistence usually according to the um, mitre ttps so this kind of payload payload execution is called as signed brain uh, signed binary proxy execution so now let's jump into the dartmuck threat model so the overall aim of our threat model is to uh, execute the payloads in the target machine um, without leaving any traces so so in order to uh, demonstrate this uh, attack we have designed a face authentication application as a prototype for our attack approach so this face authentication application is very simple so it will uh, it will perform user authentication based on the uh, facial image data let's say uh, for the normal users so uh, this user authentication method will uh, capture the data from normal user uh, and it will pass the captured images as a query to this predict user and then this predict user uh, will interact with the pre-trained google teachable machine model that is hosted on the web and that will be accessed through web api and it will get a response in terms of target prediction confidence which is a probabilistic value uh, which will measure how much the similarity of the face with the trained model uh, trained image based on this uh, prediction uh, confidence so uh, user authentication will be you know accepted or rejected so this is basically very simple and we assume that the attacker has compromised the victim network and induced some malicious payload uh, in predict user method so this is how the normal scenario works uh, so in the normal scenario as i explained earlier just the normal user will perform the face authentication application by calling these two methods uh coming to the attack scenario uh in the because of the malicious code uh, embedded in this predict user method when the when this malicious code identifies a target with a decent prediction confidence it will trigger the malicious background process which will on a fly will you know contract the malware repository which in our case was you know github repository containing the malware and it will pull the payload once the payload is pulled to the victim machine uh, we will use the script from our uh, exe which is a lol bin uh, which stays in the victim machine already so we will use the signed binary proxy execution by using this legitimate uh, script from our 
dot exe uh, to perform the final payload execution. So this is the attack scenario. And in order to uh, perform this uh, attack, we have constructed five different experiments. Like in the first experiment, we have pulled the you know Wanakai ransomware on a fly after identifying the target. So we have performed the same experiment with different prediction confidences. So we see that you know um, 80 percentage prediction confidence is the you know uh, good for this kind of uh, attack uh, attack in the victim mission and. Uh, in the second experiment, uh, we have wrapped the payloads with UPX binaries, and then we have pulled the payloads. Uh, in this experiment, we have used uh, um, what we can say we can we have used the boot sector Petya ransomware. Uh, once the target is identified, uh, that boot sector ransomware will be deployed into the victim's machine. So we have performed the same experiment. Uh, you know, we have performed these experiments with different prediction confidences. But we have observed that you know, for the packed binary execution, the total time taken for the uh, complete execution is considerably less. So this is the takeaway from the experiment two. Coming to the experiment three, uh, usually in any corporate networks, whatever the payloads downloaded to the victim machine, so those will be scanned across the uh, signatures from various repositories called virus total or something. So in order to avoid such kind of attacks, we have what we have done is uh, once the target is identified, uh, this time we have pulled the fileless malware, uh, which is a networker variant of fileless malware, and then this fileless malware will inject the payload into a legitimate uh, service called chc.exe, which comes default uh, with the Windows machine, uh, which is a dot, which comes under the part of .NET uh, .NET library. So the payload will be injected into this csc.exe and it will completely stays in the main memory throughout its execution and it will never touch the hard disk. So we observed that after performing uh, the experiments with different prediction confidence, so targeted fileless malware is the pestilent one. And uh, so the time taken for compl uh, complete execution for this kind of payloads is very less when compared to the previous experiments. Uh, so coming to the experiment four, uh, the recently we have seen a trend of using smart uh, devices or you know uh, like Alexa and there are users are uh, interacting with such kind of IoT devices to perform their day-to-day -day action. So we have tweaked our threat, uh, threat model in these experiments to you know perform the speech-based targeted logic bomb execution. That means you know once the uh, once is once a particular speech was listened and with a decent accuracy, then the malware payload will directly pull the payload from the GitHub repository and perform the uh, payload execution in the victim machine. But uh, there is a catch in this particular experiment. Like while performing the experiments, there are different constraints. Like you know, the user accent and uh, background uh, background noise is impacting the you know the prediction confidence. So that's why we are able to perform this experiment with a 65 percentage of prediction confidence only. So this is about the experiment four. And coming to the experiment five, we have considered a case where you know the attacker has very limited knowledge about the uh, victim or target. So most of the times the targeted person may not be a public figure and his data may not be available in the internet. So what we have done was we have taken a single image of the target and we have tried, uh, we have used the SYNGAN, which is a uh, generative adversarial networks to synthesize the uh, image samples of various scales as shown in this image. And we have used those images to train the Google Teachable machine to perform the uh, attack. Uh, so we have performed all the previous three experiments by using the SYNGAN based model and the normal based model. So uh, while comparing the results, we can clearly see that you know the SYNGAN based model is taking more time when compared to the normal model. Uh, we are able to execute the payloads with 72% uh, prediction confidence in this experiment five. So these are all five different experiments that we have done in our research work. Coming to the discussion points, so why Dartmouth kind of attack uh, becomes very difficult in the real time scenario? As we said, uh, uh, there are mainly two reasons for this one. So the first one is for identifying the target and pulling the payloads. Uh, the malware is trying to 
hit the google servers and it is trying to hit the github repository both are legitimate operations in any corporate network so any network level firewall or intrusion detection system may not block this kind of traffic just because these are uh, these are day to day operations going in any corporate network and also once the payload is downloaded also we are using uh, you know the script from our binary which is a legitimate legitimate application developed by the microsoft itself to perform the final payload execution in the victim machine although we have you know uh, used the very popular payloads in our experiments the attacker can always come up with you know new payloads which will uh, for which the signature may not be available in the virus total uh, database etc so in such scenarios the dartmoor data uh, dartmoor kind of attack detection will become very difficult and apt actors might use such kind of attacks uh, for uh, you know achieving the persistence uh, and coming to the second point uh, the role of facial data and the targeted attacks so recently we have seen many experiments or many cases like you know sophisticated uh, honey pots high interactive honey pots will be used to trap the advanced attackers and you know they used to reveal the motivation behind the attacks in the recent times so in order to avoid this kind of things uh, the arbitrary execution will be minimized by the apt attackers in the near future by using this kind of facial data and uh, you know voice data to perform the precise targeted payload execution so that is the one case and the second one is the timing of apt attacks so in general for the traditional malware the dwell time that means you know uh, the uh, the time between the initial compromise and the final data exfiltration and the clearing tracks will be very less for you know normal malware whereas coming to the apt the dwell time will be very high so attacker can attacker used to stay in the network for a long time undetected so in order to perform uh, you know the precise uh, attack on a specific target this kind of uh, facial and voice data will assist the apt attackers to perform and time the attacks with the perfection so these are all the two points uh, that i would like to highlight from our research work and although we have used uh, google teachable machine which is a open source uh, and freely available in the internet for performing these attacks there are alternatives like gradient notebook and you know amazon web services for this thing Uh, but uh, we have chosen the google teachable machine just because of its simplicity and we don't need to perform any uh, you know authentication for uh, you know accessing the models and uh, which is very lightweight and easy to deploy so that's why attackers can you know migrate or move towards such kind of uh, you know open source services offered by the you know big companies like google to perform such uh, perform the targeted attacks in the near future so coming to the conclusion part so as a proof for this targeted malware trend we have developed the novel threat model uh, to design and deploy the target specific payloads by using the by misusing the legitimate services and also we have validated our threat model with five different experiments um, and in our observation the fileless malware execution turned out to be the you know quicker and the pestilent one so in future maybe such kind of attacks will occur from you know any of the state sponsored apt groups so these are all the key takeaways coming to the future direction so the dartmoor attack approach can be extended for you know iot ecosystem also so the attacker can you know hook any of the malicious payloads into the you know, end devices at the iot machines uh, uh iot devices so that he can perform very targeted attacks and we are also working in a directions to consider you know slider gan and mixed match gan to consider the images of 360 degrees images of the users to build much more robust uh, malware uh, so that we can come up with effective solutions and finally we believe that you know the comp the, the library of complex threat models need to be uh, made open source for the research community uh, especially for the apt attacks so that we can come up with uh, you know better effective solutions uh, in the near future that's all uh, these are all few references and i am open to take the questions thank you thank you very much for the presentation are there any questions from the floor so no, uh, there are no questions okay thanks now thank you
Servers, servers, servers, architectures, and security elements. Are there any presenters here for this paper? I think they are not here. They are not here. So, therefore, I skip this presentation. Next presentation is a recorded video. Can you start the video, please? Uh, uh, 50. The section of the method anomalies with machine learning methods. Hello, let me introduce myself. This is Isan Khan. I am a competitive master master's student here at Hopkins University. At the same time, I have been working as a civil engineer in a company for three years. Today, I will talk about the study conduct with Mr. Asafor on the detection of cyber attacks with uh, machine learning methods. As you know, technology is developing exponentially fast. I don't think that information technology is also being some important threats at this. Cyber attacks is one of the most important of these threats. <coughs> and crucial uh, for business and personal safety. At the same time, the thing that cyber crime causes a very serious damage and cost worldwide. On this page, you can see the news and the statistics uh, shared by some of the institutions. Cyber attacks have been increasing the uh, turbulence and complexity of this. This increasing turbulence and complexity has been further advanced and continuous innovation in defense strategies. Although traditional infusion detection and inspection methods are still widely used and recommended, they are no longer uh, sufficient to meet the demands of increasing security threats. That's why infusion detection systems are being developed uh, to identify and classify cyber attacks. Artificial intelligence-based methods are used more frequently in order to contribute uh, to the solution of this problem, we created models using the nearest algorithm and the nearest based level, which are machine learning, machine learning methods. You can find detailed information about the general algorithm and the based method in the white papers. Uh, however, Okay, we'll do about this. The nearest framework algorithm is among the supervised learning methods uh, that solves classification problems. We increase the number of the nearest framework of the total credit data. In the methods, the similarities uh, of the data to be classified according to the known behavior problems. In the learning sheets that are determined uh, and the distance to the nearest neighbor uh, is calculated to the distance metric. In our study, the methods default distance metrics, the uh, equivalent distance uh, was used for the general The predicted results uh, by models are given in our study confusion maps. My device uh, theorem uh, aims to produce results by using universal uh, text and observation in creating a model uh, of any situation. The most important uh, feature that distinguishes uh, this approach from classical methods is that it uses observation and some opinions in the prediction of information. The occurrences of events A and B can be calculated as a solution. Now, the general effects of the UNSW to be able to do a data set values where real modern normal practices and scientific alternative behaviors be generated by the 
Curtis Code, who in the cyber range level uh, of those three studies in the center. The dataset consists of a total of 257,673 uh, rows and uh, 49 codes, uh, and includes the source and destination ID for the authorities. We created a total uh, of five solar models for K equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. We used 70% of the dataset to train the models and 30% to test the models. If you look at the results we have obtained as a result of the test, the accuracy for the K value equals 1 is 93.04. The difference for the K value uh, equals 2 is 92.2. The increase for the K value equals 3 is 93.17. Uh, the K value equals 4 is 93.73. And for the K value equals 5 is 93.19. Presentation and improved animals identifier. Please. Welcome to the 10th International Security and uh, Forensic Symposium in this great place. My name is Ray Kosman, and uh, this work was done by one of my students, Jing Li Lu. What I will do is I will give the context for the problem and discuss the motivation and the technical details are the table. Data mining, you know, a lot of us use data mining. So the question is how I can mine the data while ensuring privacy. In other words, I have some data to offer and if I leave it to the world, they will know it came from me. I do not want people to know that. And yet, we want everyone to use the data set. So that is what is called a privacy preserving data mining. 
Okay, so that is what we'll be getting to. Uh, some of you may know this algorithms like association rule. If I go to the grocery store and I buy, um, you know, eggs, pancake mix, what is the chance I will buy some blueberry syrup? Because there is an association to blueberry syrup if you buy anything related to, you know, pancake items. If I know which one to. Okay, so privacy preserving data mining. As I said, I want my data to be shared with the world, yet I do not want anyone to know that the data came from me. So that is what privacy preserving data mining is. Here is a simple example. I have three nodes. Yes, one, you know, to you are right, and yes, two to the left and then S3 at the top. Now suppose node S1 wants to share data value three. You can see that value three there, value equal to three right here. If I send this across, this guy will know three came from S1. Do you follow me? I do not want anyone to know the value came from me. So what we do is we add a random number to three, which is what we have done. So three plus five is eight. Of course, the number may not be positive, it can be negative, whatever. Okay, and then the other guy, uh, we are doing what is called the secure sum. So the goal of the problem is we want to add the three numbers from the three different guys and everyone should know the value of the sum, follow me? But no one should know who the data came from. Okay, so as you can see, the sum, three plus five plus eight, the sum is 16, follow me? But we don't want anyone to know who gave three, who gave five, who gave eight. So what is happening is three is sent with a random number addition, and then eight is sent. And then that guy sends number five. Eight plus five, that becomes 13, you follow me? But yes, three will not know what the value of yes, two was. And then yes, three will add its number and then sends 21. When 21 comes back, this guy can know the, the total is 16, by subtracting the random number five, follow me? So 21 minus five will give you 16, which is the sum. So that is what the secure sum problem is. It is weak to collusion resistance. Collusion means if you and I like to collide, we'll be able to figure out what is called there. You follow me? So we can prevent data leakage using collusion, despite having collusion, by doing what is called edge disjoint Hamiltonian cycle. What is happening is we are splitting, we are splitting the data across multiple paths, follow me? So you and she and I that collide, collude, uh, I will not be able to reveal, figure out her data set because all the data did not come through both of us. So that is what is called yet disjoint Hamiltonian cycle. And this kind of illustrates, you know, we have two cycles. One is the orange and one is the blue. So any value that I want to send, I split this into two different paths. Half of it I send here, and then the other half I send it through the other path. So the point is, if I'm sorry, I'm talking too loud. If these two guys were to collide, they will not be able to figure out this guy's result because all the data of this guy is not seen by both of them. They see some of it, but not all of it. Because of that, they will not be able to discover the uh, complete data.
Okay, so this actually gives a concrete example of how the uh, data splitting actually works. Oh, Mr. Chairman, I have five more minutes, maybe? Yeah. Okay, so now let me extend the problem to what is called the anonymous ID assignment. What is this? My name is Ray Crossman. If I send something, you guys will know who am I. Follow me? Instead, what I want to do is I want to give an anonymous ID, ID or identity to each of the participants. You follow me? So if data were to come from ID 123, you do not know ID 123 is associated with Ray Crossman. So that is what this problem is. I would like to give anonymous ID. How do we do that? As you can see, it looks a little bit complicated, but the idea is still kind of like privacy preserving. For example, I may take an ID one, two, three, and then somebody else may take an ID one, two, five. Follow me? So you and I don't take the same ID, but because we are taking it randomly, it is quite possible there is one other person who takes the same ID one, two, three. So there is a collision. There is a collision. So that is what this slide is trying to explain. And we will use some random numbers to kind of send the data across the loop. And then ultimately, I will get the data back. And based on the data, I should be able to conclude my ID 123, two options. Only I took that ID, nobody else did. That is option number one. Option number two is there is a collision. Two or more people, me and some other people have taken the same ID. In that case, we will go through another round. Do you follow me? So to illustrate, um, as you can see, it looks a little bit complicated, but um, ultimately we compute the sum and the sum happens to be one, zero, two. What does it mean? We have three guys, A, B, and C. First guy, the sum ends up being one. That means whatever ID that person took, nobody else took that ID. Do you follow me? So that person's ID is good. Let us go to the third, this one. This says two guys end up having the same ID. Follow me? That's what the number two means. So if the number ends up being more than one, there is a collision. So we have P0, P1, P2. P0 has gotten an ID, so P0 can leave the algorithm. P1 and P2 have to go for a second round. Okay? And they will follow a similar process, and eventually they will be able to get an ID. The question is, how long will it take? We have done some probabilistic analysis, and it says that there is a non-zero chance that the number of rounds we have to go through. Follow me? First round, there is a collision, so I go to round number two. Round number two also, there may be a collision. I go to round number three. The question is, how many rounds do I need? This map shows the number of rounds is infinite. So that is not fun. Okay, that is more math. Exactly, so that is what I'm getting to. So it looks like it is not practical. Okay, so what we have done is we have done modification to this algorithm that the paper discusses. It's a little bit more math where we are able to guarantee that the algorithm will terminate in one round. The algorithm will terminate in one round, but the number of data that we send is a little bit larger. Finally, but the upside is there is a finite termination and each one of us can get a unique ID. And with that ID, whatever I send, you do not know who that ID corresponds to. So broadly, that kind of concludes my talk 
Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for the hype and the floor is open for questions. Any questions? Can you tell us how you achieve this uh, final part in the bundle of one? Uh, correct. So there is a little bit of math in that uh, algorithm where we add additional pseudo random numbers to the end that I did not get to. Correct. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Any other questions? Yes. Please. Uh, is there any redundancy in the data that the message can go keep going round and round in the uh, the question is, is there a redundancy because the data is going round and round? The answer is yes, if they go through multiple rounds. But by reducing it to exactly one round, that redundancy is eliminated. Any more questions? Okay, thanks. So, next, uh, next, uh, next presentation uh, Outline Fiction of Secure Virus Sensor Networks Based on ITRS. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Ahmed. Yes. No, you're not. And the second one. You have the second one? Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. For That's that. right. Oh, yeah? Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. Yeah, please. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. I would like to welcome the first to my presentation, which is how the education to secure wireless as a network is on my forest. Uh, we are from a military technological college from Oman, and uh, my name is the director and the second author of the, this video. These are the, my contents or outlines of my presentation. So I will just start with the introduction. We all aware that there is a lot of advancements happening in microelectronics. Okay, so what happened is sensors or the CPUs are becoming smaller and smaller and smarter. Okay, and USN means wireless sensor networks. This is a new generation of the technology for collecting and gathering information. And uh, this is an interesting and then connect to the the the user via the internet. Okay, so this USN application first is inspired by the military applications like uh, by the LTE surveillance or the, the the biomedical or gas detection application. But nowadays it is uh, broadly used in our everyday life. But uh, because we are using so many sensors and the sensors are small size. So sensor nodes are actually resource constrained in terms of the energy usage, in terms of the size, and in terms of the computation power. And one of the problems of the DLS and network is it is too easy to be manipulated or hard, or sometimes the sensors are damaged, okay, so that it cannot get sent the, the correct data to the, the sinker. Okay, and the DSN is application oriented network, it means that how we deploy the USN is depends on the application. So this is a figure of the, how the USN works. So you can see there are a lot of sensors and this, uh, it will send the, the signal, all the sensor nodes will send the signal to the sync and then sync, uh, sync will send to the, the user through the gateway and internet. So uh, sometimes you use the uh, USN in uh, different uh, application or different environment. Sometimes you have to use hash and unattended so that there is nobody. So we don't know if the sensors are working or not. So sometimes you deviate from the expected data. So that's one is we call outlier. So it is not giving the way uh, the, the data we expect it. Okay. So it is called also called anomaly detection. Okay. So if we know that there is an outlier in the sensor so that we can 
uh, remove the sensor so that it will not disturb the sensor network. So, so many researchers are giving attention because of the security of the VSN is very important. Okay. So, the, it can be so that it can send the, the data securely and protected way to the user without giving any uh, wrong data. So if there's any uh, outlier, if we don't know that, if we don't uh, uh, remove the sensor, it will be difficult to manage. So outlier detection is very important. So most of the development algorithms focus on the event-based detection. It means that it will depend on the how the one is something happen, it will be um, that activated the algorithm, okay? And then it has a high computation, okay? Because of, uh, as I said before, our sensors are small, and it has a low computation power, so we cannot use a very sophisticated algorithms. Okay. So, so here we use a machine learning algorithm called Isolation Forest, which is an unsupervised learning algorithm. So what the I forest do is it will make the sample data and then do the processing following the structure of the tree by using randomly selected feature. This is like a random forest, but this one is, uh, it is uh, removing the, the node instead of the, uh, what you call it, classification or detecting the, the singularity. So I, I forest the capability to work with a low power device. That's what we wanted because uh, your sensors are small and computation is small. So it can also work with a small data set if we have a small um, the number of the sensors. Okay. So because of this, so much, uh, so many researchers uh, did the research in this field. Uh, like uh, Samabati, he used a non-parametric approach. Okay, he calculated the density of the streaming data from the sensor, and then it's uh, outlier of the network or sensor is detected. Okay, use the kernel approach and only but it's only used for the univariate data. So the features of the data is the only one. Okay. Another researcher also used the parametric approach to classify the abnormal nodes of the sensor. The method is good, but the time based association was not taken in the, the method. And also several others study the artificial intelligence, use the artificial intelligence uh, to detect the anomaly. Okay. And some people also use the distance-based method, which is used, uh, done by AML. Okay, this type of method is good, uh, but the computation is, is very complex, but uh, so that it would not be suitable for the, the functionality of the USM. Another author, CN, also presented the class of this method, and came up with the supervisor and supervised consensual method to detect the outlier. So the method can show that it can detect the anomalies. Uh, drawback is the problem is the same data set may show the higher density on one specific region of the data collection field. So also some other researchers also propose a classification based approach uh, to detect the outliers in the US. Some other researchers also the, did in this field. I will not go through the, all of them okay, because of the time constraint. But the, most of the algorithm, the, the drawback is the competition is uh, is the complex and competition cost is high, so that will not work with the USM. Okay. <clears throat> That's why it needs to develop the mechanism that can work with a small sample data set and low power source. Okay. So we use the isolation forest algorithm to use the, uh, to detect the anomaly in the USM. Okay. So we consider the network level of the NX cross N points. So sun and also community channels are static, it's not dynamic, okay, it is a station. Uh, sun signals have a responsibility to collect and send the data to the station. And we created the data set, okay, which is, uh, we consider this the temperature from 20 to 25 degree it is, is the normal range, okay. So what the method do is it plots the data randomly and finds the anomaly of the outlier nodes. Okay. It doesn't need the profiling of the normal point. Okay. It will begins from the sample of data points. So it will select the data points randomly and then it will 
uh, go further many uh, many times. Okay. So these are the main procedure of how the isolation uh, forest works. First, it will select arbitrarily select the feature P and state value of Q, and always it will be compared. P is less than Q one one. Okay, and then it will repeat again and again. Okay, okay. so recursively repeat the steps one and two till the existing node will contain only one sample, or each existing node has the same value. So whatever is left behind, only one. That will be considered as an outlier. Okay. So the step one to three will be repeated several times okay, by the, the isolation forest. Not only one time, it will be but uh, many times because it will choose a sample randomly multiple times. So these are the, the, the equation of the how the isolation forest works. Okay. So C n is actually is a normalization constant, and we have now the final one is S. S is actually an anomaly, anomaly the score, okay, which is the main uh, the, the score point. On that we discuss, uh, we decide which point is an outlier or not. Okay. So these are the, the we created the uh, ten hundred uh, uh, nodes, okay, with the temperature, and you can see that the parameters of the simulation, okay. And we did this uh, solution for us uh, algorithm and do the simulation in the Python. So we have 100 uh, data points, average is from the 20 to 25. Okay? And we have some uh, outliers values is the inside the data set. Okay? We define the threshold, what is the threshold of the anomaly score. Okay? If the score is smaller than predefined or threshold value, the data point it will be considered as a Anomalous. Okay, so the, this one is showing the temperature of the nodes in simulation for the hundred nodes. Okay, it is showing the box plot and then showing also in the scatter diagram. These are the, the table of the uh, the ten data out of, out of the hundred data set. Okay, it is showing the scores. It's an anomaly score which is S. And then the decision is one and minus one. Minus one means it is the outlier. Okay, so in table three, it is showing the all the sample of all the outliers. Figure four shows the anom anomaly scores. Okay, you can see that the down one, it is which is uh, very close or less than zero. These are all the outliers. Okay, and figure five score is a heat map of the anomaly score from the uh, zero to end the end. These are the shown in this program. Which is a differentiate between the, what is a normal value and what is a outliers. So just to conclude my presentation, we use the isolation for us to detect the outlier for the VSM or RSM standard works. Okay. And it's they also can see that it works well with a small data set and the computation cost is not high. Uh, the simulation is that shows the detection of the outline. This is an anomaly discourse. The outline detection has almost uh, no errors. So in future study, we will combine the algorithm with the statistical method. And also we are working with the different kind of algorithm, like a decision tree, which is a supervised uh, algorithm to detect the outliers. And also we have a plan to implement the hardware level. These are my references for the paper. And Thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you for the presentation. Any questions? So, I have a question. How are you going to implement it in hardware? Yeah. Are you going to use one? Is that hardware? What are you thinking about? We are going to implement the sensors. Sensors? Uh, we are going to do the, the, the whole system. Whole system? Yeah, with the small, small sensors. The sensors and the cross-segmented. Yeah. Okay. So our uh, last presentation is again pre recorded video. Uh Channel Crypto Security and Cryptography Broker.
caseros. Entonces, desde que hay una interlaz a los internados, y son otras personas fuera de las zonas animales, que se incluyen y necesitan su honor. Cerro y punto. Message or data identification is a way of detecting 
or verify, verify the integrity or legitimacy of data attached to it. A need to prove into the I also have to through those of analytical codes over a few fields. Analytical codes are defined in a field of four degree equation. In this scenario, define what in the equation so that operations can be performed on these points, thus obtain other points. Blockchains are a number of letters distributed over a network, so data records are distributed across the network and stored in a different locations. Blockchain as the principle of distributed transactions or blocks over the network. Transactions are in the network. This network cannot be shown and for an operator of a number, it is necessary to create a new record with the operator record and what's the name of the blockchain. Blocks and transactions. Each data set is stored in blocks and this same blocks consist of information or transactions. Peer-to-peer, the peer-to-peer -peer network is a decentralized communication model with a little blockchain. We, the principle of sharing and storing data in a set of network nodes. Smart contracts fill the need of a conventional agreement. They comprise clients of all composed and distributed on the blockchain perform activities in light of set conditions, meaning it is a for the process chosen to validate or publish transactions. Performance analysis, where performed by the style of movements, in order to make a selection of sociological characteristics such as a match. Which, depending on its size, will increase or decrease the number of files or data blocks. That can be completed using the same key and without compromise of the signal. The objective is to implement a evaluate the spiral communities that provide security guarantees and a good support for the easy implementation. This test served as a guide for choosing the algorithm tools. As the excessive factors of the algorithms will be transmitted, as well as other assessment components and characteristics. We intend to implement this framework in different languages in order to expand the number of IoT devices that can have this framework in their systems as well as implemented new algorithms and new technologies, which hope to give a more practice to security of data. And the blockchain is one of them that is intended to be implemented for the authentication of data blocks. In the comparison between ciphers, in some cases, it can be observed that in speed of there is a better performance in equating the size of the blocks. Sometimes these performance equations are not so relevant and they lose the quality of performance in comparison with other signals. With the different size of input data as well. There is variation in the performance when compared the various signals <coughs> in addition to the performance impacts of these signals delivered from the characteristics. They may not interfere with the performance, but even so, they influence choice of signals bring with them important signals such as the size 
of balance, the authentication of each flow, and the access to each flow implement. Our history creates together with the various performance results. We'll have to reconsider when chosen to use any system. The goal is to create a frame which looks like a a lack of a security perception of the systems which programs that in a quick and intuitive way they can use in Britain in their project files based on best practice. Thus, being able to read, write, adapt, delete data from a file, from a simple phrase, and see that was already now performing this type of operation and files. With the studio ready very out, the project will contain algorithms with authentication included in them. An authentication process will be created while operators that do not have a block of education, something that we consider essential to be created thanks to the benefits that authentication provides. A lab to authentication and do to the security levels that one may want to share. The use of blockchain technology in the project is project for the future, something that we will still exact trainer and still in order to be able to use the blockchain in the best possible way, having in the mind to be able to provide a good performance of the framework. Okay. If anyone has any doubts, questions, comments, or one to know more information, please contact me via my email address. Thank you very much. Thank you. We can conclude our session. Thank you very much for participating and listening. Thank you very much. I would like to remind you that we will leave the hotel at 6 30 pm for the gala dinner. See you. Thank you.